All right, ready? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to start day two of the May CWCB meeting. There's a couple of updates. Our ranks have been thinned a little bit uh, today. So Dan Gibbs has some LCS to do. So we have Kelly Romero Haney in, in his spot. Um, Becky has something else that she has to attend to. So we're going to have eventually, I guess, Lauren uh, Riss in her spot. And then Commissioner Greenberg uh, also is not able to join us. So, and then Director Brody is uh, in DC, I think. So she had a busy night. Um, and I think we, we, we have Paul and, uh, or Director Boucher and Director Cloud, are they on? Good, okay. Director and Director Ryan's online, okay. So yeah, um, and we could have uh, quorum challenges. So we just wanna make Director Bruchet and Director Cloud aware of that. If you have to step away for a while, um, maybe let me know because it, it could come into play apparently. Also today we have some, um, you know, we have our public comment period at the very end of the meeting, but we also have a request for public comment um, on item 22B, a couple folks. And so, um, which is just following the break. And we had a, another request for public comment, Josh Kuhn. And so um, we'll do, we'll have him speak following our morning break as well. So we'll kind of do all that stuff around the same time. Um, and then we, yeah, we have a few recusals today. So Director Bruce Shea, I'm one of them on item uh, 25A. So either you can run the, run the show from where you are, or um, if that's not gonna work for some reason, we can have Jackie. Director oh, Brown, <laughs> you don't get to decide anymore. <laughs> and a delegate. <laughs> so anyway, we'll um, we'll deal with those things as they come. So um, we're going to head into basin directors reports, and the first one is the South Platte Basin Director Report with Director Sakata. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've asked that my presentation be brought up. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I thought we had a great meeting yesterday, so I really appreciate it. And I starting off with a picture from our farm. Uh, this was, actually, believe it or not, this was actually sunrise, uh, but looking to the west as the moon was setting behind the Rocky Mountains. Uh, just really reminds us of what a wonderful place that we live in and how fortunate we are to really be here. Um, in my tradition, um, I always like to start off with thanking those who participated in the last meeting. Uh, Viola, thank you so much. I know it's a lot of extra work when you, we had two boards and commissions working together, putting on that event, but it was really fantastic. So, and Commissioner Greenberg, thank you so much for helping us organize that too as well. I, I thought that was very, very worthwhile. Um, for those of you that uh, that are virtual, sorry you're missing out, uh, but uh, for my fellow board members, you'll find in front of you salsa made from Millburger Farms. Uh, we do some stuff with them. Uh, Shane was nice enough to send me a case, and I thought right away I know exactly who I want to send this to. So let's hope that the growing season is good so we can have some more of that in the future. And so there are a few empty seats there. So first come, first serve, you know, for the extra <laughs> box. There, there, go. there goes Serge. Uh, so thank you, Shane, and thank you, Millburger family, for that. I'm starting off with a slide that I actually stole from Corey, a presentation from Corey DeAngelis, Division One engineer. I actually talked to him about using it, but he made a presentation to the Northern Water Spring Water Symposium. Um, you know, it's so easy for us to just look at the snowpack reports and oftentimes you'll see the South Platte throughout this spring season has been any hovering anywhere between 90 to 95%. I think it hit 100% there for a short period of time. But really when you look at the sub basins uh, in the South Platte, there's a very wide range of snowpack conditions. Uh, the the image on the right is actually the sub basins. Um, if you look at the St. Vrain in the north, uh, those basins were averaging about 150, 125% of, of average. You look there to the south, Boulder Creek, um, the upper South Platte, they were struggling to reach 65%. And so that was a big concern to a lot of us on the South Platte River. I think that's why majority of the metropolitan cities had already declared drought conditions and were restricting a lot uh, outdoor 
irrigation. And then also, so for we augment our irrigation wells through Central Water uh, Conservancy District. They had their member meeting about a month ago, and it really shocked all of us when they said they were our allotment for the pumping for this year was only going to be at 35%. Uh, it, and that was because of the lingering drought effects. Last year, there wasn't a lot of water that they could divert. They had a junior water right and couldn't divert a lot of water to fill those augmentation plans. So really, again, when we think about the, the changing climate and how it's affecting everything, there's long lasting effects, even though we see a pretty good snowpack in the majority of the state for now. Um, oops, wrong way. Also uh, had the pleasure of being able to go to the Southwest Water Conservation District in Ignacio for their water seminar. Um, um, Director Cloud and Director Boucher were also there. It was really a pleasure to be there. Uh, thanks to Ken Curtis, who he organized an ag panel down there, uh, which uh, Director Boucher and I were able to be a part of, as well as Simon Martinez with the Ute Mountain Ute. But what was really interesting is at the podium right now, you see Bart Fisher. And Bart is a farmer in the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, and he was former commissioner to the Colorado River. So I actually had the opportunity to have, have dinner with him the night before, and it was really interesting to exchange uh, ideas and thoughts and concepts about what's going on in the negotiations. So really, thanks so much, Steve Wolf, if you're listening, and Ken Curtis. I really appreciate the opportunity. You put on a great event with Elaine Chick, and uh, definitely I'll be down there again. I really appreciated the opportunity. On this picture, I really want you to guess who is these three gentlemen are speaking to. Any ideas? <laughs> yes, that was our very own uh, uh, director of water policy for DNA Dark, uh, Kelly Romero Heaney. She was um, keynote speaker at the Arkansas Basin Forum. Uh, she, Kelly, you did a fantastic job. You really did. I know that was right during the peak of the legislation session, the end when you were under a lot of pressure. Uh, it, and it was you could it was apparent by the people that surrounded her after that. Uh, but you did it. You did a great job. <laughs> you just tall. Huh? Yeah. And also um, CWCB staff did a great job. Anna Moss, uh, Russ Sands were there talking about the water plan. Um, and then um, Mark Shea, who's the chair of the Arkansas Basin Roundtable, also did that. So great work, you guys. And really uh, kind of a legislative update. Yesterday, um, uh, Lucy Kellerman, representing from Congresswoman Caraveo's office, uh, uh, was here and attended. Thank you, Lucy, for attending. Um, we actually had Congresswoman Caraveo to our farm and had a farm bill listening session. So, you know, water was a top priority in that conversation. And she she really was engaged with us about what we were interested in. And as we heard from Director Gibbs and also from Commissioner uh, Greenberg yesterday, really thanks so much uh, and everybody's work for the CREP. Uh, as I talked to Deb Daniels uh, on the Republican River Basin, you know, they're working so hard to meet those compact conditions of of drying up those 25,000 acres, every little bit helps. And it was to relay another story. I talked to a reporter that was at this event and this person told me, he said, wow, we're kind of surprised that all these big names were at this event. It was like for the Republican River. And it is kind of a shame that the Republican River is kind of like that forgotten river basin in the state. And so it's nice that we're paying attention to the, the ag com communities that are out there. And then um, Master Gardeners, does everybody here know about the Master Gardener program? So CSU does a, it's a volunteer group, individuals that are really interested about gardening, about plants. Um, Master Gardeners had a statewide conference. I think for our efforts, you know, as we talk about water conservation, this is a group that maybe we should really reach out to because these are people that are really engaged and want to be involved. And they're kind of uh, helping those individuals that don't know too much about what's going on. Um, this is Catherine Morvec with the Colorado Springs Utility was talking to them about water-wise landscaping and irrigation management. But I think another reason that this is a good group to, to um, reach out to is I was invited to talk about Roundup and not rounding up people, but round up the pesticide, right? And so another thing that they go through on training is really how to interact with people. And I wanted to share a few of the slides I took during a presentation from Sue Schneider who's a CSU Extension State Health Specialist. 
And they had this right before our roundup panel, I think intentionally, because to really help us all better understand uh, or improve our communication techniques. I love this cartoon. I love this cartoon on this slide that you're going to see here. It says the one person saying, do you even hear the words I say? And the other person says, hmm, only the ones that I like. And isn't that so true? I think it's so important for us to look at, you know, those habits that really block our mindful listening, you know, whether we're impatient or, or projecting our own thoughts or, or feeling like we're the expert uh, or the biases that we have. Maybe we're being reactive. It could be because of our own insecurity or judgments that we have in advance or any, even our in, inflexible agenda on things. Um, then um, she asked really to look at three questions. What's your intention? Do you really want to hear the other person, what the other person is trying to say? Number two was presence. How can I stay focused and attentive so I don't drift away, which is so easy to do with all the interruptions like our phones and everything that we have around us? Openness. How do I stay curious and not driven by my own agenda? And then four strategies. I thought the first one was one that I was really going to have to work on. Because it seems like when you get into an intense conversation with somebody, it seems like we all want to push even harder when sometimes maybe the best approach is to ask permission to step away for a while for everybody to kind of cool down and reflect a little bit and then come back together. Number three is really you hear that a lot step into the other person's shoes, but I think it's really important to do number two first and that's really to step into your own shoes and really look at yourself and what your perspective where you're coming from. And of course, to communicate wisely. And really, as I've talked to some people around the basin, um, and I know I experienced this when I first came to the board, not knowing how people were going to react to the comments that I had. I tell you, I've been so impressed with our new directors and your, your engagement. I was very timid to participate in the beginning, thinking that, you know, not knowing the audience, but I hope we can really develop a culture that we can feel open and free to discuss our thoughts and our feelings. And have people understand that, you know, we're developing our own thoughts. Just because we make a statement here doesn't mean that we're live or die in that position. But let's engage about how we want to develop those feelings and those ideas and those as we move forward. I think that will really help in all of our conversations in the future. So welcome to our new board members. You're doing a great job. I'll tell you. Thank you. Well, as you guys know, I always try to include a drone image. Oops. A drone image. So this is my drone image about, a, oh gosh, darn it. Sorry. Sure. So this is my drone image. We started planting our corn about a week ago before the rain hit. Um, and so this is planting going on. This is really kind of to demonstrate technology. As this planter gets to the end, you're going to see that he lifts up, there's 12 individual rows there. He lifts them up all at once, but really because of uh, GPS technology, this is on a center pivot. So the edge of the field is actually curved. It's not straight. And so what it's doing, we set up a barrier where the end of the water is going to be, and it's turning off each individual planter as it gets to the end, so we're not planting beyond where the water is going to be. So it really is amazing, the technology that's available right now. But now the, the rain has been a blessing in some cases, but now it's really a hindrance as we're getting behind and the number of days that it takes a corn crop to grow, we're thinking that we, we may have to change some varieties. And because of the drought conditions I talked to you about earlier, we're debating whether even to leave some ground fallow because of the uncertainty of how, how much water we may have. This is the South Platte Basin Roundtable. I really want to thank all of our roundtable members for the de dedication they have. Again, not to pick on Kelly, but this happens to be the day when she came to the roundtable to talk about the stream restoration stuff. So I think the roundtables are a great opportunity to pass along information and to receive input. And I think Kelly, you did a great job on doing that. Um, I'm going a little long here, but this is the Erie last Saturday. They had an Erie downtown fair. And um, when we talk when we talk about WECO, I hope to bring this up again so if I don't remind me about this. As I was driving into town this morning, too, I saw, I saw that the first Saturday in June is Bertha Days. So uh, remember that as we talk about the WECO efforts. Uh, another exciting thing that I got to do on Tuesday night was join the City of Brighton City Council. They had a poster contest for elementary school kids about um, water, water conservation. conservation. And it's just it's amazing, amazing activities that are going on. Um, so that poster really says, it says it all, save some water for us, your children. So I thought it was really cool. 
Really, thanks again to Northern for hosting us here and also for the tour. This is a picture of the tour. The magnitude of Chimney Hollow is just so impressive when you actually get to see it. I mean, all of us, we can go online and actually see live feeds of what's going on there. But to really to view down from the lookout point and see the, uh, all the everything going on like an ant pile, it was really amazing. And then also the bottom left-hand picture is actually a fish ladder that they had built in Poudre, in the Poudre River, which is really interesting to see as well. Well, this was a week ago when we had a severe hailstorm. You know, I always uh, cringe when I see big thunderheads like this approach. And unfortunately, we did get hail. This is a picture of me sitting in my pickup. I was at a stoplight, but taking a picture and you can see actually the white hail piled up there. I, and when I re-looked at this picture, I thought really it was kind of appropriate that it was in the background is a sign that says urgent care. <laughs> I was talk to, talking to Director Ryan uh, yesterday morning. I said, you know, as humans, it's a good thing that we have a uh, bad memory because I think if we didn't, especially us farmers, I don't know that we would stay in farming if we, we remembered all the bad things that we went through. But speaking of good things, really, I want to thank you so much, Director Brown, for your leadership this past year. Really, been, it's been an honor to serve under you, and I've learned so much, and um, just look forward to continue to work with you this year in a more relaxed position. Very relaxed. And then finally, out there in the Wonder World, uh, <laughs> I wanted to embarrass you, Director Mitchell. I hope you're listening online. Again, thank you so much for all that you do. It's really amazing. <laughs> I know she's going to love this one. <laughs> and this was a better one. I could have picked others. <laughs> so Director Mitchell, I'm actually being kind to you. and But I am passing out to you uh, as soon as the next time I see you, I'm going to pass along something that I've used uh, numerous times. And it's my freaking out mini book. So thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell, for all that you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Director Sakata. Any questions for him? Okay. All right. So next up is the Arkansas River Report um, with me. So um, sort of like Director Sakata, I'm going to just review a few um, key uh, events or meetings that I attended over the last couple months because for me, they really tie together um, and underscore what I think we've really been working on down in our valley and in Chafee County. I've mentioned this before, but kind of the interconnectedness of um, wildfire mitigation, agriculture support, managing outdoor recreation, and then how does wildlife, wildlife habitat, and water sort of weave through all of that into one sort of big coherent landscape scale challenge. So uh, shortly after our last meeting, I, I got to go to Glenwood. They had a, I hoped, I'd hoped to see Director Vasquez there. Is that right? Vasquez, yeah. Um, because it was a statewide uh, BLM RAC meeting that they convened. And uh, I was invited to, along with the, um, the park manager for the Arkansas Headwaters Recreation Area, I was invited to come speak to that group about the Arkansas Headwaters Recreation Area that, that's about 33 years old now, 34 years old, something like that. And it's really been a, an amazing uh, collaboration between federal and state uh, land management agencies in a way to, I think, manage recreation and also to support um, elements like our voluntary flow management program, which you know works with the um, Bureau of Reclamation in Southeastern to provide augmentation water in the summer for um, recreational boating. Um, so that was that was a really neat got it. that was a really neat um, experience to be over there and just to share that and to I think make people realize that every solution, every situation is going to be different, but there are solutions that have been in place for decades to some of the challenges that regions of our state were facing. And it's not a cookie cutter approach, but to hear about how other parts of the state have addressed something maybe has gives folks some tools to look at their own issues. Um, shortly after that, the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, which is a massive sort of multi-jurisdictional collaborative approach to looking at um, forest health and wildfire mitigations in our state, had a um, significant 
meeting and there was uh, sort of half hour updates from each of their three priority landscapes in the upper Arkansas Valley, Chafee and Lake counties are uh, one of those landscapes. And again, I think we got to sort of open up some new perspectives there in that the forest health work we're doing is often very tightly tied to trying to enhance wildlife habitat at the same time. And in doing that, we've been able to tap into funding, um, say through the National Fish and Wildlife Service the Restore Program that was really just intended for, for wildlife habitat, but we're able to kind of um, sort of double down on, on both wildfire mitigation and wildlife habitat enhancement in a way that, um, you know, only makes sense, but it also is, um, you know, kind of a, a more impactful expenditure of those federal funds sometimes. And uh, so that was a, just a, a cool experience to get people thinking like, okay, how do you maximize, just like we talk about maximizing beneficial use, how do you maximize the beneficial use of these dollars uh, as opposed to water? And um, again, it was kind of got, you could just see the wheels turning with people and thinking about different ways to do this. Um, I participated in the CWCB board orientation with Director Vasquez, uh, Director Combs, and Director Cloud, in part because I never got that, or if I did, I don't remember it. Um, but it was, that would have happened to me right at the beginning of COVID, so I don't think I, I ever got it. Um, so I really enjoyed spending the afternoon with all of you and, um, you know, working through some interesting questions with Jen and uh, Lauren, and it, it was a I just got to know everybody a little better. I, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, soon after that, I went up to Winter Park for the uh, Partners in the Outdoors kind of summit meeting, uh, the Regional Partnerships Program of Parks and Wildlife. And it was um, a really neat experience. There was, I don't know, maybe 150 people or so kind of sequestered up there. And um, the first hour and a half of that meeting was... Uh, big panel discussion about what we've been doing in Chafee County with Envision Chafee County. And again, sort of pulling together these different landscape scale challenges and trying to find ways to address them um, both collaboratively across jurisdictions, but also collaboratively uh, sort of across challenges and trying to stack the challenges together and stack the money. And again, achieve the maximum benefit for the money that um, an effort that we're putting in and, you know, once again, it was just really neat. It's like a certain point in life or something for me, but just getting to share these things we'd learned, not because it's, a again, a template or anything, but just because it, if you think about some of these ideas and tools and apply them to your own situation, you may find uh, real relevance there. And so um, it was great to spend the day again with sort of a multi-jurisdictional team from our valley um, and just helping people understand how we had um, made progress. Um, after that, it's just been a series of things. Um, in fact, Anna, you can put up photo number one. Um, we uh, we had uh, Michael Bennett came to town to help us with the groundbreaking for uh, a new uh, sort of emergency operations center and EMS and sheriff's building up in Buena Vista. And we had gotten about a million dollars through the congressionally directed spending. So uh, Senator Bennett came to help us with that groundbreaking. And then we took him up Poncha Pass and, again, talked about wildfire mitigation, talked about the importance of building wildlife habitat into that effort, and also some of the challenges we've been having with, with funding. Uh, you know, you, you get a grant, and that's just the beginning, right? You don't necessarily get any money for sometimes quite a while. And so had a really good conversation with him. But I think uh, he was very attentive and engaged in everything. But the next day, he really, um, really came to life. Uh, and we got to go fishing again on the Arkansas River. He did catch that fish. In fact, he caught about 12 that day and um, really made some progress on his fishing. And it's a pretty neat thing just to spend six hours standing in a river next to your senator and just you know, shooting the bull all day about, I mean, you got a captive audience, right? So uh, it, it was a lot of fun. We had a, had a really good day and um, really enjoyed spending time with him. Um, shortly after that, the Arkansas River Basin Water Forum happened. Uh, Robert was there. I got to have lunch with him. 
And um, I would just concur with his assessment. It was well attended, really great meeting. And um, yeah, just kind of, I felt like it was a truly an event, something we've been talking about. It's, it's a regional event of statewide significance. And um, Kelly was one of our um, keynote speakers. She did a she did a great job introducing herself to our basin and also um, kind of walking people through what DNR is working on and, and their priorities. And then our new division engineer, Rachel Zancanella, was the speaker the next day. And I think she is really, um, really making a mark. She, she's a remarkable woman and uh, has just a lot of great communication skills and is kind of dragging us all along uh, in her you know, sort of the mental gymnastics she has to go through to figure out who's in priority and how to manage all that. Um, we can go to the next slide. A couple of days later, we had a huge event in the Arkansas River Basin that you all have been a really critical part of. We finally had our true groundbreaking. We had a practice one a couple of years ago, but we had true groundbreaking for the Arkansas Valley Conduit. Uh, the pipes were on the ground there. Both senators uh, were in attendance and uh, dignitaries at the federal and state level. And Becky uh, gave a great speech at that, Director Mitchell. And um, I have to say, and I think everyone I talked to said the same thing, it was the most singularly positive event we'd been to in years. And by that, I mean, it was just everybody was psyched. Everybody was pumped. And um, there was just like no sort of shadow side <laughs> To this event. And um, you can go to the next slide, um, Anna. And so this said it all to me. That's Camille Tootin, the commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation in one conduit pipe and Becky Mitchell, our uh, beloved director in the other pipe. And, and it just really spoke of the sort of federal and state partnership to deliver fresh, safe drinking water to an area that has suffered from water quality concerns for many, many years. Um, so it, it was a really special day. And um, just want to thank all of my colleagues for supporting the, um, the several allocations we've made for this project and just your continued support. You can really feel the momentum building. And then um, my last slide is... Um, just to underscore that I live near the center of the state, not I'm slightly south and slightly west of the center. I'm right near where Highway 285 and 50 intersect. We call it the crossroads of the Rockies. Don't like you passing through without stopping by. And um, Commissioner Kate was coming through a couple of weekends ago and came by. Um, we uh, we took her dog swimming down in the South Ark in my backyard and then had a nice lunch together. And anyway, I just want to have that open invitation to folks. It, we have a humble home, but we're always glad uh, to see visitors. And so hope for more as everyone's traveling around in the summer months ahead. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Let's move on to, uh, let's see, did Director Brody join us or no? Okay, so we're going to skip over her and go to the Rio Grande with Director Combs. Um, hope I can make this work. Um, so so uh, yesterday I alluded to the fact that um, I had lived in Italy and spoke Italian and there was a poem I learned there and I want to, I'll explain it afterwards, but it says, quel fiore, tra i fiore, non sempre, non sempre mostra la sua propria bellezza, come que, quel fiore che può crescere tra la mondezza. And what it says is a flower among flowers doesn't always show its unique beauty and doesn't sometimes seems less than that flower you see growing in the rubbish. And so myself being that flower in the rubbish, I wanna thank um, all of you, um, honestly, of CWCB staff, who sometimes might get blurred in the lines of staff for all the work you do. And I hope you don't get lost in the unique characteristics and qualities that you all bring to this organization. 
um, quite frankly, that was one of the driving factors that made me want to um, apply for this position was because the quality of the staff and the quality of the work product and, and what comes out of this. Um, I want to thank um, Heather Dutton now that I'm in my second meeting and I realize all the work it is. Um, I wish she'd have been reappointed. Um, um, honestly, though, um, for the work she's doing with the roundtable and the work she did here, uh, um, it's fantastic. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate this board for the welcoming nature and uh, the openness and allowing us to participate. Um, which, which arrow does which? Is it advances? Okay. So um, right after our last meeting, we went out through the round table and we had 29 attendees. Um, we had some staff, we had some press, we had all kinds there for uh, an opportunity to go to one of the snow courses. And our CS staff took us out to the Wolf Creek site and we got to look at that site. Um, we actually got to do a snow course. There's a little video after this one. And then afterwards, uh, Wolf Creek um, Ski Lodge hosted us. Um, for pizza, and we talked about their augmentation and their snowmaking facilities and all of that. Um, so, yes, um, while I am addicted to um, the internal combustion engine and the smell of exhaust, they actually did get me on snowshoes. And we actually got to ride back down the chairlift from the ski resort, which was that's very unique. I've never ridden down a chairlift, and it's a completely different view. So, um, can you start that one, somebody? Wish Andrew was here to see we can do it. That's deep snow. So that is yours truly. Um, interesting, we had 11 feet of snow and 41% snow water equivalent, significantly higher than normal, which um, at this point puts us um, out of Article 7 on the Rio Grande Compact um, storage in post-compact reservoirs hinges on what's happening in um, Elephant Butte in southern New Mexico. With this kind of snowpack and this kind of water, we are actually um, out of Article 7 and able to store in Platoro. Um, probably the first time in about seven years we've had conditions that allowed for that. So it's a, it's terribly feast or famine in that basin on the storage. Some of the other reservoirs, the Rio Grande and some of the others have uh, winter storage capacity. We do not. And so as uh, Director Ryan was talking yesterday, this is a significant year. We, we never get into that, that fabled open river scenario, but we are actually, yesterday we got into full priorities where all priorities are being served on the in the canal system. And I think the Rio Grande is getting close. Um, so then um, in April 19th, uh, we toured the uh, Native Aquatic Species Restoration Facility there in Alamosa. Um, that's Kevin Terry. He is the local director for the Trout Unlimited. He is also the vice chair of the round table. Um, he hiked, and, and I, I don't wanna get it wrong, but he hiked and got some native species rescued out of a creek brought them down to this facility and they're still brooding. There's part of the brood is they're fish in a herd. <laughs> they're, they're part of the brood stock that they're still using for native um, genetically pure um, species there in that, in that area. So you can tell he's quite excited to, to reconnect with his fish. Um, we also had April 21st, the Rio Grande compact meeting in Santa Fe. First time in 10 years that all three states have signed the accounting. Um, there's been a big um, controversy over the accounting of the uh, um, water in Elephant Butte. And so first time in 10 years, the Supreme Court ref water referee got things worked out. Everybody except the federal government signed off on the accounting. So that was a big deal for us there to finally have verified accounting of our compact status. Um, then on May 11th, we went down into Director Cloud's area and we got to tour um, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe's bow and arrow mill, their farm and ranch, and their water facilities. Um, we got to see all of how they're producing their water pipelines, all their pressuring, how they're using all that water out of the, the Dolores project. Um, and the automation, they put a ton of money into this facility and they're employing um, 
I'll get the number wrong, but they're employing a significantly higher number with the trucking, with the facility managed, it's all computer operated. And so the technical um, abilities that they've been adding there have just been tremendous. And of course, now they're turning a profit where they're um, direct marketing their own corn. They do the white, the yellow, and the blue, doing really well there. Um, and then the next day I had to come back, but they were able to turn the Dolores pro tour, the Dolores project and see the, all of that project and the canals and, and all the work they did there. So we've been traveling a lot. We've been working a lot. We've been going a lot of places. And um, this is a little creek up one of the driving into the Canales River. Typically in high runoff, it runs 100 CFS. Um, May 13th, it was measured at 450. Um, it's, it's neat to see. Um, I do not want anybody having damage. I don't want destruction. But high water is kind of like a train wreck, right? If it's going to happen, you want to be there and see it. So here it is. I got a picture of some of it starting. <laughs> Sorry, Director Sakata, I, I don't want damage. I don't want damage. Um, so that's the end of it right there. So thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments for Director Combs? Director Sakata. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Combs, what can I say? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess I could bring a Japanese haiku next time. Would, would that help? <laughs> but really, welcome aboard. And, and please send our best back to Heather Dutton. Um, she's doing an amazing job. And thank you for all your work that you did on the on the roundtable for many, many years. I mean, it really takes a great leader to make those roundtables successful. And I think the success there was in part to your dedication down there. So I know they'll miss you, but tell Heather hi for us and, and uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to forever look at you through uh, the context of a bouquet. Just don't look at me through the context of Dolly Parton. <laughs> I just okay. wanted the quote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the Yampa White with Director Brown. All right, we're gonna fight with the microphone again. Um, you know, just continue. No, continuing. I know we sometimes like to do themes at the board meeting. Just um, been feeling very grateful um, of late, um, and there's many reasons for that. But um, certainly grateful to experience this huge honor being on the board with such great people, as evidenced by the day-to-day -day interactions and humor and passion people have for um, rivers and their communities in the state of Colorado. So thank you all for your dedication. Um, I was really, it was really special to have the Department of Agriculture in Steamboat um, at our last meeting. It was a really hard meeting as anybody that was paying attention that that meeting knew. Um, and just to have the juxtaposition of having really tough meeting, but being able to interact with people um, who, again, are just incredibly passionate about the work they do in their communities was really special. And, and I hope that other future boards get to experience that um, with the Department of Agriculture, because it's a huge connection that we have, but with other boards and commissions across the state, um, and and districts as well so uh that was just a thank you to staff too for for being able to do that um things are you know pretty intense in, on the yampa drainage we had a banner year as many of you know and hopefully those of you who like snow um got to experience it was pretty spectacular um so one of the things that I was doing is trying to not have my phone on me. So I didn't take a lot of pictures, but know that I had a great year and I'm not going to tease you with all of those pictures. And that has rolled right into rafting season and uh, had the, the opportunity to be out with my friends and, and boating the town run of the Yampa. And that's been um, just, you know, we haven't had a year like this. And, and when you, when you, work in rivers, you get to talk about water and rivers all the time, but also really special when you 
um, when your best friends all like to be on rivers, you get to talk about the last years that it was like this or what, you know, past runoffs look like. And, and that's, you know, probably a, a conversation akin to being a rancher or farmer where you sit around and talk about the same, um, the same exact stuff, just in a different, in a different way. So we, you know, have just been, um, discussing the uniqueness of this year and this runoff. It's been a cold, um, late start to spring. And, um, right now the town run is unrunnable in a, in a raft because of bridges, but it, this morning was running at 30, 3,370 peak last year, um, was 1800 and we're not near our peak right now. I don't think downtown we, we could keep going maybe a couple more thousand CFS, depending on how runoff comes, comes down for us. And then um, we hit 20,000 at the Deer Lodge gauge, which is the, the gauge going into Yampa Canyon. And that max, you know, typically can hit 12,000 as a peak. It can even hit as low as, um, you know, eight or nine, just depending on the year. And, and again, because we are, you know, a quote wild river, the runoff has a huge piece to do with how we actually peak on our river on the Yampa. So it'll be anyone's guess to see how things continue there. Um, we had 30 inches of water in our snowpack uh, at the last check, 157% of average, I believe is what we peaked out. And we're still at 131% of average as of Monday. So um, lots and lots of snow. Um, and I'm super grateful for it. You know, it's great to to have a year like this and have people experience um, nature at its finest. And, and we all know that it's, there's going to be, there's going to be years where we're, you know, uh, we're drying up in March and we have the winds and all of the things that contribute to um, our, our air aridification of the West. So I'm um, just trying to sit with that gratitude and um, be there. I also, super grateful. I went to Mexico. That was nice, but I got sick as one does sometimes in Mexico. I have no idea exactly how, but man, am I grateful for our water system. So when you put up the pictures of <laughs> the conduit, you know, it's, we, you don't realize until you, you have those experiences where how lucky you are to have clean drinking water and clean food to be eating because of that. So I just wanted to share and not rub in that I got a little sunshine last month, but um, just a couple things going on in our basin. Um, as I've been on this board, we've talked about our integrated water management plan or our stream management plan process on the Yampa. And we didn't do the entire stretch of the Yampa, but we did a good section of it. And that was final at one of the last board meetings. I showed you a slide of that report. Um, and now we're moving into implementation and just really excited um, that we have highlighted infrastructure projects, especially um, along our, our ag corridor and people really starting to um, take advantage of not only the plan that we did, but some of the... Um, some of the things that we did in our valley to help people apply for grants, because we know that they are difficult and time consuming to to do when you're you know running an operation or frankly doing anything. There's still you know money's free money's never free, um, and so we're really seeing some of the fruits of that labor. We had a couple um, projects come through the the roundtable, but then also in our fourth year of granting. Um, funding out of the Yampa River Fund, which has been great. And so just really exciting that, you know, kind of seeing some of that stuff come to fruition. And, um, you know, these are some of the projects that we're working on in our valley are, um, they're going to take years and years and years. So I'm happy to report still that the Craig Yampa River Corridor Project is moving along and just a shout out to Melanie, um, Kilpatrick for her work. She's with the city of Craig and she's just done an amazing job putting that project together. Um, a couple things coming up in the Yampa. It's sort of a big year 
um, for highlighting the AMPO, an awesome year to do it too. Uh, WECO, Water Education Colorado is going to be up um, touring the entire basin, which I'm really uh, grateful for. There's some really neat areas of our basin that don't get showcased all that often. And so that's the first full week of June. And I don't know if your tour is full. No, the tour is not full. So um, if Robert, yeah. if you don't have anything to do, <laughs> um, but all the rest of you out there in YouTube land and anyone around the table, a uh, really cool tour. And uh, so that, that's the 6th and 7th, is that right? Of June. Awesome. Um, and then right around that time, the weekend before is the Yampa River Fest brought to you by Friends of the Yampa. It's obviously going to be raging and um, it's so fun. And so if you're finding yourself in the valley and have time to come check out all the all the things that we we do to celebrate our river, please do. It'll look a little bit different um, because it's so high, but uh, there'll still be people doing crazy things in the river and it's it's really fun to celebrate with the community to do that. And then also the Center for uh, Western Weather Extremes is helping our water community put on um, at the annual seminar on the Yampa River, which is really cool too. And that is also that same, um, the, excuse me, the week, the Friday, Thursday, Friday prior to um, the River Fest, so the second and third um, is when that is. And so if um, if you want to come up to the AMPA, you can come to any or all of those events and we'd love to have you. Uh, finally, I just wanted to give a brief shout out to Becky for all of her work. Um, she's in it for the long haul. And I just am really, as I said yesterday during our Colorado River Agenda item, just really pleasantly surprised at how the negotiations have gone and um, proud of her for her work. And um, she's a tough woman and and I'm grateful to have her as a friend and and have her leadership ship here and excited to see what she does in her new role and who we um, get to have join us here and and watch over staff. So and thanks to Lauren Riss for looking looking all over <laughs> as she has been um, predisposed with that. So um, that's all I have. Just uh, hopefully you all carry the mes message of gratitude in your lives and just remember how lucky we are to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. Are there any questions for her? Okay. Let's move on to the main stem Colorado with Director Bruchet. Thank you, Chairman Felt. Um, first of all, I wanted to let you all know how sad I am not to be with you. Um, illness started in the family Friday, Saturday, and hit us pretty hard. Um, and I, I felt it very appropriate to stay away. But I guess you don't realize um, how much I enjoy spending time with all of you and being in two-day meetings until you do it from Zoom by yourself. It's very lonely. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm bummed out, too, is that that tour on Tuesday, I had it worked out with Joe Donnelly to do a sweet hat trade. So I'll have to hook up with Joe on another day. Um, also, congratulations, Chairman Felt. Um, and thank you to all the directors, but particularly Director Sakata. Um, I'm honored to be vice chair. Um, look forward to working with all of you. Um, and I think it's going to be an incredibly fun time. Thank you to Director Brown for your service last year. Um, it being my first year on the board, um, it was truly an honor to watch the way that you handled meetings, the way that you brought humor uh, to a room that sometimes was full of non-humorous situations uh, to keep things a little bit light. Um, and it appears that uh, our new chairman will have a, a similar approach, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, Director Mitchell. Um, it's been a privilege to work with you for a bunch of years in the role with CWCB. And I'm thrilled in your role as commissioner. I know that we'll be working together closely. Um, and I look forward to this going on. Um, Director Sakata pointed out, we had a, a great time down there on an ag panel. Um, uh, the Southwestern Conservation District Annual Conference, uh, really neat to be on a panel 
uh, with Bart um, discussing, you know, agriculture from California to Colorado, Front Range to West Slope, and how <clears throat> we're all working towards resolution in this situation um, within our own businesses. Uh, very interesting time. I also had the privilege of being invited to uh, testify to the uh, Subcommittee on Conservation, Climate, Forestry, and Natural Resources um, in DC on April 20th. Nothing like being in DC with Senator Bennett on 420. He cracked a pretty good joke about it. I don't know how much he meant it to be a joke, but it was fun. Um, I'm gonna try and keep this a little bit short today, hoping I don't go into a coughing fit, but it's always, uh, you know, May is always kind of that time of hope. And um, I wanna continue my theme of my message of hope. Um, really interesting last year in March, how bleak things looked for the state. Um, and then fast forward, you know, to this year, you know, looking at May where we all sit right now. Um, I think there's, there's reason enough to be hope, but I, I want to take everybody back a couple decades in the Colorado river basin. Um, it was actually the spring of 2003. So exactly 20 years ago, um, that my family sat down and, and had the conversation that, uh, we either live in the wrong place or we have to make some substantial differences because, um, what we were doing, uh, we were facing some obstacles to try and operate our business and grow food that seemed relatively insurmountable. Um, we didn't even really know who to contact about some of our challenges. We had our county government, and thanks to champion Lurleen Kern Underbrink, we had the River District, um, but really all of those pointed towards different potential fights, conflicts, confrontations with Denver and Northern. Um, our trans based and diverting partners. Um, basin roundtables didn't even exist. Um, and then if we go forward to today and what's actually happening within our basin, what's actually happening within our state in the mode of solution thinking um, for the preservation of water. Um, starting here in 35 minutes, uh, there's a learning by doing management and technical committee meeting in Grand County um, for all of those partners to discuss further things on what's happening in the headwaters partnership on the East Slope and the West Slope uh, coming together to solve problems. Um, my family and neighbors can irrigate at a low flow river that we could not two decades ago. Um, but even more hopeful is fortunately we don't have a low flow river. The last three years uh, in the late part of May and the first part of June the upper Colorado in our neck of the woods has been um, in a 180 to 220 CFS river. And um, as of about 30 minutes ago at the KB ditch, the Colorado river is flowing 2029.31 cubic feet per second. Um, it's a pleasure to see and the system really needed a flush. So um, we're all excited about that. Uh, during this time, uh, the state created a water plan. And not only did we create one water plan, but now we have an updated water plan. Um, guiding us and having a roadmap for what our state can and should do um, facing some of the challenges that we have. Um, <clears throat> and the, the second part of that water plan, the updated water plan, also, you know, as a reminder, was the largest public outreach process in state's history and something that I think the water community should be very proud of. Um, we now have crops being planted in the basin, uh, drought resilient crops, some with the intent of perhaps participating in water savings programs and some with the intent of just keeping agriculture alive in water scarce basins and those projects that are happening um, to do that are not only doing it independently but they're doing it under grants from the water conservation board they're doing it in partnership with amazing academic institutions um, agronomists um, trying to find scientific approaches to how we do this from our soil treatments and soil amendments um, to the establishment of some of these crops and how we can survive. Um, sorry, I got lost in my notes here. Um, but all of this really looking to make not only agriculture more resilient, but looking at ways that when we talk about resiliency um, regarding water scarce issues, um, all of these efforts really going in that direction. Um, I have a very old school neighbor that has grown straight alfalfa on a center pivot for a very long period of time. 
who in the past three years has desperately struggled with his water supply to keep alfalfa alive, um, that has torn out his alfalfa. And the first week of June this year is planting sandfoin and working with the broader partnership um, to further study and prove what uh, total volume and nutritional feed value sandfoin can have as a water saving plant in replacement of alfalfa at high altitude. Um, it's very exciting. We have Kernza growing at 8,000 feet, um, and we are clearly in agriculture making efforts in the Colorado River Basin to make a difference understanding where some of this goes. So to, to kind of bring this all together, you know, we talked yesterday as a board about unity within our state. Um, we talked yesterday as a board of the importance of open door uh, communication for other organizations, groups, individuals to make public comment, to, to make concerns known, um, to feel that communication with our board. And I think that with the, the passing of Senate Bill 295, creating the Colorado River Drast, uh, Drought Task Force, I wanted to point out you know, a, a very short list of a handful of things um, that have been done in the last two decades regarding you know, the unity of the state of Colorado the roadmaps that have been laid and some of the processes that have been done, you know, working towards um, a more drought resilient future for our state. I believe in that and I see it. I look forward to our board and agency, you know, working with the drought task force and working with other organizations within our state um, to further find ways to stay united, to stay together, to really be in this mode of solutions. Um, I think that. Uh, it's very interesting when I reflected in preparation of this particular director's update. Um, my wife and I try and teach our kids a pretty simple message of love and kindness and hope. And, you know, regarding this with um, our water supplies and what we face within the Colorado Basin, um, but also within the state of Colorado, um, you know, there, there are processes that give me incredible hope ways that when I think of what my family faced and what our directions were two decades ago to where we are today. So for all of those that have been involved in that and making a difference, uh, my sincere gratitude. And for all of this, um, for all of us on, on this board and people who work um, with us, I look forward to continuing this into the future. And I do see a very hopeful future. So with that, I will conclude my director's report and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Boucher. Any questions or comments for him? All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have the San Juan and the San Miguel Dolores River Basin with Director Cloud. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me the time today. Um, I do want to say, you know, I am sorry that I um, am not there in person. Um, I was looking forward to it. Um, my daughter graduated on Tuesday night, so there wasn't enough time for me to get from one area of the state to another, so please forgive me for not being there. Um, so with my report, um, I'm sure that you've all seen the article in the Colorado Sun about my appointment to, um, to the CWCB. Um, it was a very well-written report or um, article. I was not expecting that article to go nationwide, so that's taken me a little bit of, of a surprise. And um, I've gotten a lot of uh, really good feedback from that article. And let me see. I also um, want to give my sincere um, gratitude to um, Governor Polis and to everyone um, with for my appointment because being the first um, tribal member taking on this role has been, um, it's been, uh, we're opening that wide, the, the doors wide for others to also um, participate. And I'm hoping that we can have a more collaborative effort within our state because state of Colorado is the best state. I truly believe that. And I also want to thank uh, Celine Hawkins for her service um, on the CWCB role or on the, on, as a director prior to me coming on. She's done a wonderful job at doing that. And she's also provided me with a lot of good information um, to help me get started in this role. And I also, again, want to thank Becky for all of her, um, her time and effort that she has put in. And, and I wish her continued success in her new role. She's going to do a really good job in, in representing the state of Colorado. 
And for my area, I just want to say that um, as, as I go along um, in this journey on the board, I know that I need to up my game in my uh, director's report because I've seen all the pictures and I think those are all wonderful. So hopefully I'll get to do the same and share um, those types of um, events and, and show you what's going on in my basin in actual photos so that everybody can see that. Um, and as you know, my basin has also been hit very hard in with the drought and we've had a lot of, of of effects from that. And so with the recent snows and, and all of the, the uh, moisture that's coming in, the rains, they're very helpful, but we still need to be very diligent because our area is still very, very dry. We've had, um, like it rained last night, but you couldn't tell this morning that, it, that we hadn't gotten any type of moisture. So um, the ground is still very dry. Um, I did attend my first uh, round table and I am very thankful to be a, a, a part of that group as well too. They're doing some really good, good things. Um, they we heard from the public education um, participation and outreach uh, liaison. Um, they she is working with the local children um, children's water uh, festival. We also heard from the local projects being funded and working on the, the Southwest Water um, Supply Reserve Fund. Um, those dollars were. Um, expand it in advance to local projects in the support of the basin implementation and water plan. Uh, we also heard from some of the projects that are continuing to evaluate, evaluate, continue evaluation and impacts of the forest 16 fire um, and supporting the different watersheds improvements and those head gates and the agriculture innovations. And uh, with those fires um, or with that fire, we still need to be very, very diligent in what is going on in, in our entire area because once we know that when rains come, that lightning is also going to be associated with that. And with our still dry conditions, um, we just need to be ready for anything that happens. And so fires are always going to be um, in everybody's um, thoughts as we go into the summer season. We also heard from the um, WSRF grants that uh, those are going to be coming in today. So I look forward to those. Um, yesterday it was mentioned um, at the roundtables that there was um, there was some concerns about the new um, drought task force. Um, I'm sure that in my next roundtable that's going to be another topic um, because I, there was some concerns in my area with that as well too. But I also want to um, appreciate and, and say that I appreciate the state um, creating a tribal um, task force because I think those are all really important um, things because you can't leave out the tribes within our basin. Um, both tribes are in my, my basin and so they need to also be representative um, because whatever happens is going to affect the entire basin, not just one particular area or um, county or anything like that. It, it's going to affect the whole the whole part. And so um, also with that, um, with our, with the drought conditions, um, we know that Ute Mountain last year had was only could only use 10% of their um, their water supply. They um, they had out of 110 pivots, they were only able to use 10. So we're hoping that that changes this year. Jackson Gulch Reservoir in Mancus only had about a 10% allocation, and hopefully those are going to improve as well too because the cities and farmers had a really really tough time in that area um and with our snow packs we had a really good snow year uh san juan county had 167 percent of the median um percent san miguel had 231 percent of the median and dolores had 259 percent of our annual snow pack and so we are very, very grateful for all of the moisture that we received, um, but it's still going to be, we are still going to be very diligent on what's going on. And I also heard that uh, McPhee and Navajo reservoirs are possibly going to be doing some releases. Um, Navajo is, I think, going to be doing, um, I can't remember how many acre feet of water, but that was more for to maintain the habitat um, in the river below the dam. And so again, with the drier conditions and the rains, it just we just need to be very diligent on what what could happen in our area because fire danger is a very real, real situation. Um, I will also be uh, speaking at the um, the drought summit 
in a couple of weeks. Um, Becky, Director Mitchell will be introducing me and I will be on a panel uh, with uh, the Executive Director for the Colorado River Com or Upper Colorado River Commission with um, Chuck Collum. And I also want to, um, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a, a great um, discussion. If anybody is interested, I hope you're all going to be there. And also, if um, we, the Southern Ute Tribe is hosting our annual Southern Ute Bear Dance. This is Memorial Day weekend from May 23rd, oh, May, May 22nd through the 29th. If anyone is interested in coming down and participating with us, it's open and we really look forward to um, having you all here to um, celebrate with us. We're celebrating spring, we're celebrating the beginning of life and it's gonna be a good time. It's four days of dancing and just enjoying everybody. And so if you're able to come on over and we'll have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cloud. Any questions for her? Um, I I do want to just uh, say I think you're doing fine, and uh, don't don't uh, be rough on yourself. It's uh, you're a long way from a meeting in Berthet, and uh, we certainly <laughs> understand. <laughs> yeah, and I think quite a few of us will be at that drought summit, so we'll uh, we'll catch up with you then. Oh, and I forgot, I'm also going to be speaking at um, the Mountain Film Festival in on the 27th in Telluride. Awesome. You're going to go to that one, Director Sakata? I might. I think I will. But <laughs> yeah, Director Cloud, really, too, I just wanted to say congratulations on your daughter graduating. I've always felt like family's first, and that's so important. I think that's a, a wonderful milestone, so congratulations. And uh Thank you for being a part of our group. Yeah, thank you. My my last one. So I have no more kids in in high school or school. So I'm <laughs> I'm happy about that. <laughs> That's a liberating feeling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to the Gunnison River Basin report with Director Anderson. And, and I thank the chair. Uh, and, and would start off with congratulations on your new tasks there. I think you're doing a great job, so uh, keep it up. Uh, I also wanted to thank Be Becky for her years of service. What a great job she's done for for our community. Uh, and I have no doubt that she'll uh, do fine in her, her new full-time assignment. Uh, I've often referred to her as a lovable pit bull, and there's nobody I'd rather have on my side in a fight than Becky. So good luck, Becky. I did have some slides, Viola. I don't know. Okay. It, I, I, it's on. I believe I'll just leave it there. Um, the uh, the Gunnison Basin Roundtable met this past uh, Monday in, in uh, Delta. Uh, one of the big issues there was uh, uh, the Colorado River issues, and, and we had quite a lengthy discussion there and, and the, some concern that they're being left in the dark. And and I've got some good ammunition out of this meeting that I'll take back to the to the next roundtable. Um, and quite a, quite a conversation about the drought task force, and and of course the interest being there is to uh, to make sure that it, the chair is someone from the West Slope, which uh, you could expect that from the group. So um, we had. Uh, and this is the most in my time at the round table. Uh, we approved seven WSRF grants. Uh, so quite a night with, with that effort. Uh, as I usually do, I like to show uh, the drought report. 
Um, you know, it continues to decrease some statewide, I believe. And, uh, and of course, the, the western slope is in, in great shape. Uh, uh, it's been it, it's been a great winter in the Gunnison Basin. Um, we're still at a at a, a eighty seven percent of the seasonal mean with our snowpack and and uh, Blue Mesa has risen at the rate of a foot a day for for several days recently, and uh, the fishing ought to be great there with all that co new cover for the for the fish and uh, i'm certainly looking forward to trying my luck up there this summer uh, i followed uh combine pass the snow snowtail site on combine pass and it peaked at 46.7 percent it almost reached 300 percent of normal uh i can tell you that we are seeing the, the flows from this uh dry creek which runs right below my house is is higher than i've ever seen in 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 at least the past 25 years that i've been back to the valley i don't believe that it's peaked yet uh it's kind of a kind of a, be careful what you wish for because we got what we wish for now we got to decide what we're going to do with it uh, the flooding issues as i talked about dry creek it is out of its banks and and uh, uh one of the county roads is is underwater i pulled up there about a week ago and was trying to decide whether i wanted to go through the flood water or back up and turn around the toyota went around me so i figured my ford pickup would go right through that so i did go through it <laughs> rubido creek i went down and looked at it and it's banked full uh the colorado department of corrections has an honor camp there and and looking ahead and rightfully so they've evacuated all the prisoners and sent them to to new hotels and removed all their computers and everything i guess and fearful of the uh of uh what what's gonna happen ahead on the north fork um colorado high highway 133 which runs from from delta to uh up through hotchkiss and paonia uh a bridge is washed out there so uh this is between paonia and somerset so the miners are walking across, catching a bus on up to the mine at Somerset. Uh, some concern about it's time to move livestock. Well, you're you're going to have to herd them by foot through that. You're not going to drive a truck through it. So, it's it's already had some uh, had some consequences. Uh, uh, I I would would end this with uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in the, the Gunnison Basin. Uh, look forward to to having you in my hometown, Montrose, Colorado. The last time we had a meeting in the Gunnison Basin, it was up in up in Gunnison. But uh, Viola and I are working to find a suitable spot in Montrose to have the meeting. So, with that, I thank you. Thank you, Director Anderson, and we look forward to joining you over there. Uh, any questions for him? Okay, great. Uh, all right, and let's go to the North Platte with Director Vasquez. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Last but not least, hopefully. Um, first of all, I want to thank all who were involved in my appointment. Um, I'm very honored to be working with such a great group of directors and uh, supported and uh, involved with such a super staff of CWCB. So thank, thanks to all of you. I have to tell you, having been as uh, Director Felt and Coombs know uh, and Cloud know in, in front of the uh, subcommittee for approval on a Thursday and then 
being not notified that we were approved by the full Senate on Tuesday to then go to the first meeting on Wednesday in Steamboat. In, in keeping with the high water stories, it was very much like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> so uh, I love steep learning curves and I appreciate what I'm learning from all of you in this room and, and beyond. So I look forward to seeing what I can bring to the table. Um, I, I want to talk about two uh, small situations in North Park or the North Platte Basin that might be of interest to you. Um, historically, our basin has been focused on water supply uh, reserve account funding of irrigation infrastructure. Um, a couple of months ago, we had um, a state a forest employee come to the round table to talk about challenges in managing um, um, the state forest. As you know, throughout the Rocky Mountain West, we have not only beetle kill and wildfire uh, challenges, but we also have challenges that are born from the um, management practices. So in some areas where we had clear cuts, the the uh, lodgepole pine or the spruce fir coming back, particularly the lodgepole pine uh, as dog hair, <laughs> and they need to be thinned uh, to, to uh, be able to reestablish not only a healthy forest, but a healthy watershed. And so we heard from um, state forest because of the state of the forest, they don't have enough revenue to be able to support funding their uh, needed management and came to us looking for some financial help. Uh, we sent him away to look for some matching money uh, and also had a long discussion about where can we see the best intersection between forest health and water um, um, flow from that forest. Uh, and so regions on Northwest facing slopes were chosen. There's good data from the experimental station of the state forest showing that lop and scatter uh, treatment of either uh, full clear cutting or selective uh, um, logging, which we're looking at here, actually improves snow retention and water runoff. And so the project that we uh, were presented with on Monday when we had our roundtable meeting um, is proposing just that. And we approved for consideration by the CWCB at the next meeting, a proposal for thinning on those Northwest aspects to try and improve the water flow into the Canadian and the, and the Michigan, which are uh, tributaries to the North Platte and to help support them. There was a lot of discussion about, we can't keep doing this. We need you know, to help support you getting started, but where will the future funding come from? Uh, this is not unfortunately um, a lucky watershed that has been chosen by uh, the uh, Rocky Mountain Restoration Project that district uh, are uh, felt um, described. Uh, I would love to propose they look at the North uh, Platte because of the abundance of wildlife and the same kind of tensions between recreation and um, our natural resources. So that's one. Uh, two, I want to tell you a little story about North Sand Creek. Um, it is a tributary to the Canadian coming off the Medbow Mountains in the northeastern uh, side of uh, the North Platte Basin. And the rancher, State Line Ranch, who irrigates out of this uh, creek, um, has had the challenge of having his head gate and flume buried in many feet of sand. And if you could bring up uh, the uh, photographs that I uh, provided, um, if you can go to the next one. Thank you. This is uh, an image of North Sand Creek from Tuesday. Uh, we were on a field trip with a number of individuals uh, looking to try and help with this situation. The uh, fence line is um, a boundary, but you can see the cuts in the sand on either side of the bank. And if you go to the next, there's a short video. Um, yes. You can see the lobes of water that are developing, carrying sand down the creek. Um, and um, so there has been some study started before COVID 
by a CSU professor in geomorphology, trying to understand the interaction between these dunes, which are uh, a mecca for off-road uh, vehicle uh, recreation, which has removed all the vegetation from the sand dunes. This is Aeolian sand of uh, many millennia age. Um, so it encourages the dynamics of the sand dunes to fill this creek in the fall. The creek is dry, the sand has filled the creek, and only when you have enough of a flush flow in the spring does it clear it out and carries it down to the head gate in the flume. Uh, so um, included in our field trip on Tuesday was a professor from CSU who's student, master student did some work on, on this uh, dune complex uh, in the previous three years, um, as well as uh, John Sanderson from the Center for Collaborative Conservation. This group coming together with the BLM, which owns the responsibility for managing the dunes to try and figure out what can be done. In 2019, there was an exclosure fence established and you can oops, you can see a little bit of uh, vegetation, including some Indian rice grass reestablishing on the protected dunes. And yet we can't protect the entire complex because it's open for uh, recreation. So this tension between recreation, uh, water and wildlife habitat are exemplified in the North Sand Dunes. So with that, I thank you for the time. Thank, thank you, Director Vasquez. Is there uh, any questions for her? Okay. Yes, Director Sakata. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did forget to mention in our report, Viola did send out my written report to everybody. Uh, I'd, I'd like to highlight that Spur of the Hydro Building uh, Backyard Grand Opening is on June 8th. So if you haven't been to Spur, that's gonna be a cool event. Also, I did include a link on uh, the Colorado uh, Ag um, School, um, had a Ag Extension Research Seminar about Ag Resiliency. And it, it's really interesting. I listened to it and uh, it, it's not just about irrigated agriculture. It's even talking about what the school is doing with regards to livestock breeding and all aspects of agriculture. Uh, uh, Perry Cabot did a presentation on there. I thought really interesting comments he made about uh, uh, using artificial intelligence in agriculture, that we have so much data collection now going on in agriculture from soil types, moisture texture, seed varieties, that uh, to manage all this, um, um, it's going to take a supercomputer uh, to do this. I often joked in the, my past, my dad had never used a computer, and all of his knowledge he accumulated, I could never put it on a computer. But it's gotten to that point now that um, it, it we're collecting so much data, how we utilize that data and manage that data is pretty amazing. So if you have a chance, use that link and look at that seminar. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Sakata. Um, so this is a first, I think. We actually come to our break ahead of schedule. <laughs> I feel like I forgot somebody or something. Yeah. Um, Jessica. Yeah. yeah, right. I guess that would have. There you go. Okay. Um, so just looking ahead, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So we'll plan to come back at 10 after 10. We will hear public comment from Josh Kuhn. We'll go through item 22A. Then we'll hear public comment from Peter Fleming and Raquel Flinker, and then go through 22B. And that'll be just the sequence. Um, so if we need to notify people um, that it's coming up, that'd be great. And otherwise, we'll see you at 10 after 10. Record.
Recording in progress. I like when Robert's in charge of the bell. Works out okay, better. we're going to resume. One of my commissioner colleagues uh, often mentions this thing he calls the uh, paradox of proactivity. And I think what he's getting at is if you do too good a job addressing problems, you never get to take credit for solving anything because it looks like nothing ever went wrong. Um, for me, though, sometimes the proactivity paradox is just getting ahead of myself. And so had I looked at my email before I uh, set the stage for this next section, I would have seen that Josh Kuhn is not going to be available. So we won't be doing that. And then uh, Rob Veal said, hey, how about if I talk about the item first, then we hear the public comment. That'll give the public comment a lot more context. And uh, I appreciate that. So we're going to uh, proceed accordingly. So uh, Rob, you've got two items here. Yes, 22, I do. 22, um, the in-stream flow and natural lake level appropriations. So uh, we'll start with 22A. Okay. For the record, Rob Veal, CWCB staff, and I am presenting agenda item 22A, which is a request for final action on uncontested in-stream flow and natural lake level water rights in water divisions one, four, five, and six. So on January 24th, 2023, the CWCB formed its intent to appropriate in-stream flow water rights on 12 stream segments located in water divisions one, four, and six, along with one natural lake level water right in water division five. So pursuant to Rule 5D of the rules concerning the Colorado and Stream Flow and Natural Lake Level Program. Notice of the board's action was sent to the ISF subscription mailing list on January 31st. So this notice provided all parties with the deadline to file a notice to contest, which was due to the CWCB no later than March 31st. And no notice to contests were filed on any of these appropriations. So this slide shows table one, which identifies the 12 stream segments that staff is requesting action on today. Um, this table is a little bit modified from your board memo just because I took off the flow amounts because I wanted you guys to be able to see it. And so those flow amounts are uh, in, the in the memo. Um, uh, as identified in the memo, staff is requesting the board make three statutory findings today. The first is that a natural environment exists. Second, that water is available for appropriation to protect the natural environment. And the third is that there will be no material injury to other water rights. So the information necessary to support these determinations is contained in staff's memo for this agenda item. The recommendation letters and documentation submitted by the Bureau of Land Management, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, High Country Conservation Advocates, and the staff's memo and oral presentation provided at the January 24th, 2023 board meeting. So along with those 12 interesting flow reaches, there's also um, Hack Lake, which is a natural lake level right, um, and provide me an opportunity to actually put a picture of, of the pretty lake that's up there. Um, and with that, I have uh, staff's recommendation. So staff is requesting that the board uh, make the following determinations and take the following actions. Um, one, determine pursuant to section 3792-1023, that for the in-stream flow and natural lake level appropriations identified in tables one and two, A, there is a natural environment that can be reserved to a reasonable degree with the recommended water rights if granted. B, the natural environment will be preserved to a reasonable degree by the water available for re recommended appropriation. And C, such a natural environment can exist without material injury to water rights. Second, pursuant to rule ISF rule 5F established January 24th, 2023 is the appropriation date for these water rights. And finally, uh, request staff work with the Attorney General's office to file applications for these water rights in water court by the end of the calendar year. So that's all I have for this item, but I can answer any questions that you may have. Are there questions for Rob? If not, I would entertain a motion. Director Sakata. Um, that, that's correct. It is when the board formed its intent to appropriate these instrument flow water rights. So that was the action taken in, in, in January. Director Poskis. 
Uh, I move to approve. Okay. Thank you, Sakata. So we have a motion and a second to approve the recommendation. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Rob. Let's go to item 22B. So we'll we'll hear your report on this, then we'll do public comment and then we can yep. go from there. So this is once again for the record, Rob Veal, CWCB staff. This is agenda item 22B. So this is a little different than normal. This is public comment and uh, staff is requesting conditional approval of terms and conditions for the ISF water rights in Water Division 4 on Cottonwood Creek, Monitor Creek, and Potter Creek. This is an action item. So on March 16th, 2023, the CWCB formed its intent to appropriate increases to the existing ISF water rights on Conwood Creek and Upper and Lower Potter Creek and the pending ISF on Monitor Creek. And pursuant to Rule 5D of the rules concerning the Colorado and Stream Flow and Natural Lake Level Program, a notice of the board's action was sent to the ISF subscription mailing list on March 21st. So as mentioned at the March meeting, CWCB staff has been working with uh, staff from the Colorado River Water Conservation District on these recommendations over the past several years. Um, this included work on the proposed water development allowance, which identified reasonable water uses that may occur within the study area in the future. We also drafted a stipulation and agreement with specific terms and conditions to include in future CWCB administrative actions, water court applications, and water court decrees affecting the proposed riparian ISFs. So those proposed terms and conditions describe how the water development allowance will operate and what administrative water court actions would be acceptable to CWCB without objection. Staff included these proposed terms and conditions as attachment A to staff's memo. And the stipulation and agreement um, has been in draft form we've been working on for the last several weeks. So Bruce Walters from the Colorado Attorney General's Office is here today in the audience. Um, and he has been working hard with the River District to, re to refine this agreement during the past several weeks. Um, the terms and conditions in Section 3 have remained unchanged. So the modifications to the agreement in the past two weeks have been logistical and procedural in nature, and they're mostly centered around Sections 4 and 7, which deal with the contingencies and if final action is not taken by the CWCB at the July meeting. So the intent of the stipulation and agreement is to allow the River District to not file a notice to contest uh, these appropriations, but have certain terms and conditions um, included in final actions if these stream segments remain uncontested uh, in July. So staff is also requesting that uh, authorization to have Director Mitchell sign this agreement on behalf of the board. And before we get to um, the public comment, I just wanted to, to go over the staff's recommendation because it's slightly modified from what was presented in the memo. But staff's recommendation is to conditionally approve the proposed terms and conditions for the Conwood Monitor and Potter Creek Industry Flow Appropriations as set forth in the draft stipulation agreement between the Colorado River Water Conservation District and the CWCB. The draft stipulation and agreement was previously included in staff's memo's attachment A for those three uh, Conwood, Monitor, and Potter Creek industry flow appropriations. The proposed terms and conditions of the ISF water rights is set for in the stipulation agreement have been finalized and will be included in final action for these appropriations at the July 2023 meeting if these ISF water rights remain uncontested. And secondly, at, uh, the stipulation draft agreement was presented in draft form um, as discussions between staff and both parties are ongoing and are focused on language in the stipulation agreement that is logistical and procedural in nature and may result in slight modifications to the stipulation agreement. So uh, up until last night, uh, Bruce had been talking with uh, Peter Fleming from the River District, and I think all the terms have actually been finalized, but just in case there's some minor modification, um, we'd assume that if there are any minor modifications after today, that those modifications would not affect the proposed terms and conditions of the ISF water rights, and staff recommends that the board conditionally approve and the board authorized the director of the CWCB to, to assign the aforementioned stipulation agreement on behalf of the CWCB with any of those modifications if needed. And with that, I can answer questions or we do have public comment. Right. Are there questions for Rob at this point? Okay. Um, seeing none at this point, let's go to public comment. So 
our first um, first witness is Peter Fleming. Thank you, Chairman Felt. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Very well. Thank you. Um, one of the causes for us um, working on this until last night and maybe even actually this morning was my email got hacked uh, while I was um, back east uh, um, uh, dealing with some family stuff and um, emails that I uh, that were coming in weren't I wasn't getting. So I missed a couple of emails from Bruce Walters at the AG's office and uh, unfortunately, that caused a little bit of de delay. So I appreciate um, Rob's explanation there, and uh, agree that the the nature of any changes are are sort of you know in the procedural aspects of the stipulation and not in the substance uh, the substantive parts regarding the in-stream flow. Um, I want to um, uh, also let the board know that Raquel Flinker from the Colorado River District is is. Um, uh, online as well on the Zoom chat. She has worked very closely with CWCB staff, BLM, and um, Parks and Wildlife, and the uh, consultant that worked uh, with the CWCB uh, on the water development allowances. And um, if there are questions about the technical aspects, she'd be the one probably to, to talk about from our perspective as well, to the extent there are questions of the River District on that. Um, these in-stream flow appropriations are, um, are unique. They're sort of a different type of in-stream flow appropriation. Um, and uh, the, uh, Raquel and I worked uh, very hard with um, the um, CWCB staff in um, coming to um, agreement on and using some creative ideas to come to agreement on uh, the proposed stipulation um, concepts that are before you. I want to um, express our appreciation for the um, CWCB staff, for Rob, Brandy, you know, the rest of the, the staff, uh, Parks and Wildlife, uh, BLM, and, and um, the AG's office, um, uh, uh, Bruce Walters for for working um, with us to um, reach these uh, pr this proposed stipulation that will allow the River District to uh, support these in-stream flows um, uh, appropriations, even though they are unique and, and in many ways, and, um, you know, sort of are effectively claiming all of the available remaining stream flow. Although it's it's a it's a little bit of a tweak on that. Um, but um, we're very uh, pleased that we are at that point, and we do support the staff's um, uh, recommendation, as Rob has just uh, um, read it to you today. Our board, we've already talked um, at the very end of, of last month, uh, um, actually it might have been even been at a special meeting more recently, with our board about um, the proposed um, in-stream flows and and the, and the stipulation concepts and, and the Colorado River District Board has given us um, delegated authority to um, myself as counsel to execute the proposed stipulation and they are supportive of the in-stream flows with subject to those terms and conditions. Um, so that is all I have to report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I did want to express their appreciation from both uh, myself Raquel uh, and the rest of the Colorado River District. Um, thank you. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Fleming? I guess I would just say um, that I, I appreciate what you're saying. This is a pretty unique approach to in-stream flows, but I think it does reflect the unique environment that they're being proposed for. And at the same time, I like the further development of the, the water development allowances as a way to sort of mitigate that uh, sort of sweeping quality of, of the in-stream flow. I think, I think people have worked hard to find a, a good balance here. And uh, I think we too are appreciative of the collaboration on this. Um, Director Vasquez. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. Uh, it's it's really exciting for me to see the CWCB and the partners that have worked on this, including you at the Colorado River District, 
to open the door to this type of in-stream flow of riparian habitat quite unique. And there may be other places in the state where this would be appropriate. So I, I really appreciate all the work in paving the way for a new type of in-stream flow. Any other comments or questions? Okay. If, if I could just comment briefly on that uh, yep. last comment, um, Chairman Felt. The um, I think you know while we we're, we're not super anxious to have a lot of these in the future, I do know that one is potentially coming down the pike. Um, I, I I hope I'm not um, spoiling anything by saying that we're hoping for something similar on Deep Creek in Water Division Five. Different circumstances. Um, different um, uh, situation there, but but um, a, a similar um, a stipulation concept at least in the in the um, in process. We're trying to get some last um, local stakeholders concerns addressed in, in in that process, and then of course there might be some potential federal legislation related to wild and scenic designation there. Um, uh, and that's uh, obviously a big a big to do in and of itself. But the concept behind the in-stream flow and the water development allowance is similar, if not exactly the same. So you might see it there. Appreciate the additional time to comment on that. It's a heads up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Um, I think we'll we'll go to Raquel Flinker. Thank you. Um, now, I think Peter um, portrayed our um, our um, thought process and um, our cooperation with the CWCB, um, and we're thankful for the staff working together with them. Um, I don't have anything specific to add um, unless there are technical questions. Okay. Are there any technical questions? All right. Well, thank you for, for being available. Um, Viola, any other public comment? Okay. So uh, we've had the report. We've had um, some comments there. There was a proposed staff recommendation. Are there any further questions for Rob or staff? Director Sakata? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so Rob, uh, if you could help me a little bit. So the water development allowances, how are they determined for each Creek. I mean, is it a percentage, or how do you go about filling? Yeah. Up? So the so we the water development allowances. We hired an outside firm, SGM, an engineering firm, to help us go about that. And they looked at the existing water rights, the potentially irrigable land in the future, the potential future uses that may occur in the future. Um, there's very limited private land in that area. It's mostly owned by the BLM um, and the Forest Service. So that's um, in that report is how they determined what the future uses may be. Um, as unlikely as they may, may be. But. So in the draft agreements, they'll, they'll be set numbers for those values then eventually? Yes. Yes. So when we come for final action and in this agreement, there there are set numbers of, of uh, CFS flow amounts and an annual average of bond metrics. All right, any other questions for staff? Or is there an interest in moving forward? I move we approve 22B. <laughs> Sorry, we have a motion from Director Vasquez and a second from Director Combs or from Steve. Sorry. Okay. I'm getting Sorry, I the, the uh, speaker in my helmet's misfunctioning. I'm <laughs> not hearing the play. Okay. All right. So we have a motion from Director Vasquez, second from Director Combs. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Peter Rob. Raquel. And thanks to our guests. Thank you. Okay. We will move on to item 23, uh, which is request for authorization to proceed to trial and stipulated opposition case number 21 CW 3026 in Water Division 3. This is the application of Sustainable Water Augmentation Group, Inc. 
and I believe that Director Combs has a confession. <laughs> Not necessarily a confession, but I'll stipulate since we're involved. Or I, was, <laughs> I will recuse myself since we're involved in this one okay. as a conservancy district. Sounds good. All right, and we've got Colin presenting on this. Uh, thank you, Chairman Fault. Uh, for the record, Colin Watson, CWCB staff. Uh, today presenting agenda item 23A. Um, this is a request for authorization for a to proceed to trial for a stipulated case. Um, so a little bit about this item. So these are kind of different than a request to proceed to trial in a case where we haven't stipulated. Um, you know, I would expect for those situations, you know, there would be kind of a more detailed description of um, what the remaining concerns were for CWCB. Uh, but this is actually a uh, case where we have stipulated um, and it's set for trial prior to the next board meeting. And um, we're really just preparing for the unlikely situation where we might need to proceed to trial to um, defend our stipulation. Um, but, you know, it, it's not expected. And, um, <clears throat> I would note, uh, this is a little background for the case. Uh, in your board memo, the CWCB stipulation date was listed as February 13th. That was the date where we signed a stipulation um, and it was filed with the court, but the court had not yet granted the motion. Um, and so you'll see now the date has been updated to May 15th. Earlier this week, um, the court did grant the motion for the, the stipulation. Um, this is set for trial on July 17th, um, just a very short 25 day trial uh, <laughs> coming up this summer. And um, yeah, and we filed a statement of opposition on February 28th. And as I mentioned, uh, the court on this Monday of this week uh, filed the motion to accept uh, the stipulation. Um, a little background on the case, uh, the applicant is seeking a plan for augmentation. It's Division Three, uh, and some of the CD CWCB concerns from the in-stream flow perspective had to do with the ability to add new augmented structures and uh, operate administrative exchanges that could uh, injure or, or have an impact on the ISFs. Um, Several other opposers have not yet settled, and uh, this, this case does remain open before the water court. Uh, this is an overview map um, that subdistrict one is the, the general location of, of the augmented um, participating members for the application. Um, are there any questions on the case? I, I'd be happy to provide more background. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll move on to the staff recommendation. Uh, pursuant to ISF rule 8J, staff recommends that the board authorize staff to participate at trial as necessary to defend CWCB's stipulation in the case identified as agenda item 23A included in table one. Okay, is there a motion? Director Anderson. I would move to approve staff recommendations on item 23A. Okay. And a second from Director Vasquez. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Okay. And next is item 24, which is proposed acquisitions for in stream flow use. Yeah. Okay. With Pete Konovitz. All right. Thank you, Director Felt, members of the board. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Pete Konovitz, CWCB staff. And this morning I'm presenting on agenda item 24A, which are a proposal for two new water use agreements with the Ute Water Conservancy District and Garfield County. Uh, these agreements would permit the implementation of short term annual leases. Uh, for Rudai Reservoir water that would be released for instrument flow use in the 15 mile reach on the Colorado River. Um, this proposal was first introduced at the last meeting in March, and that, uh, per the ISF rules, initiated a two meeting process to consider the acquisition and solicit public comment. 
Um, at this second meeting, the board could take action uh, on this proposal. So today I, I'd like to just review the proposal uh, and then present the staff recommendation and try to answer any questions that the board might have. So again, a location map just to reorient reorient ourselves. Uh, Rudai Reservoir on the right-hand side of the figure is located on the Frying Pan River. Uh, releases from Rudai would go down the Frying Pan uh, into the Roaring Fork River and then down to the main stem, Colorado, traveling down to the 15-mile reach, which is begins upstream east of the city of Grand Junction and continues downstream to the confluence with the Gunnison River. The 15 mile reach is designated as critical habitat for four uh, federally listed species, uh, the bony tail, humpback chub, Colorado pike minnow, and razorback sucker. Um, because of the diversity of habitat in this reach, it's particularly important for the pike minnow and, and razorback sucker because it, uh, it's all, all stages of life occur uh, for those species from spawning all the way through adulthood. Um, the CWCB has leased water on an annual basis to supplement its in-stream flow water rights in the reach, as well as help meet uh, U.S. fish and li wildlife flow targets to support the Upper Colorado River Endangered Fish Recovery Program, which is dedicated to the conservation and recovery of those species. Um, CWCB has leased water from the Ute Water Conservancy District annually since uh, 2015 and from Garfield County uh, since 2020. So the fish and wildlife flow targets uh, vary depending on hydrologic year type. And these are recommendations for the base flow period, which is typically post runoff through the end of the irrigation season. Um, the A10 shown here is a dry year flow target. This year is different. Uh, it's been designated or will be designated likely as a average to wet year. So those base flow recommendations increase to 1,630 CFS. Um, but this figure is just to illustrate sort of the importance of these supplemental releases uh, in green on this figure, you could see the what would be the native flows in the reach um, without supplemental releases, and then blue is the flows in that year with the, those releases made to benefit the 15-mile reach. Um, so one thing you could see is that, you know, even with those releases, those flow targets are not often met, and this is true for most years, um, but these releases do significantly boost the flows in that reach, and then in some cases prevent the river from uh, completely crashing out. And um, one other thing to mention is that the water that CWCB leases is part of a larger portfolio of water that's dedicated to this program. There's other pools of water stored in Rudai, Wolford Reservoir, and Granby as well. Uh, but the water that CWCB contributes is significant. In some years, it can approach almost 20% of the total volume of water uh, released to the reach. <clears throat> so the agreements, um, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, both allow, they're designed to allow for the implementation of short-term annual leases with these entities. Uh, the proposal with Ute Water uh, would allow up to five annual leases to occur over the duration of the agreement. And with Garfield County, uh, the proposal would allow for one annual lease with the option to renew for an additional year. Um, with, Gar with Ute Water, um, the proposal is to be able to lease up to 12,000 acre feet uh, and then 350 acre feet from Garfield County. Those agreements don't include minimum amounts, so it's at the discretion of those entities of whether they would be able to or want to make water available for lease in a given year. Um, if approved, then the intent would be to implement the first annual lease under those agreements this year. So they're fairly straightforward. These agreements sort of govern the uh, terms in which these leases are implemented and operated. So they address items such as the volume, timing, rate of releases, payment procedures, hydropower use. Um, so this water could be used for hydropower uh, at the Rudai Reservoir power plant below the below the dam, as well as the, uh, the Vinelands uh, power plant operated by the Orchard Mesa Irrigation District. So on its way to the 50 mile reach as an additional beneficial use. Um, there's a, a requirements for coordination with other agencies and stakeholders, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and so the agreements with you and Garfield are, are very, in terms of substance, um, it's identical, uh, but one difference with respect to the Ute water proposal is that we've requested that if there's any water that remains in storage that's unused after the irrigation season, so by October 31st, that water could be released in December for winter instant fill use on the frying pan. And so this is just a contingency um, scenario. So to ensure that all of the water released is put to beneficial use in the very unlikely event that there's water left over. Um, in most years, as we mentioned, those targets are not met, 
um, and we will take steps to sort of mitigate the possibility of, of water being left over. A little bit more on outreach. Um, so we obviously will coordinate with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Reclamation on the releases. Uh, we will coordinate with CPW to minimize impacts to the fishery, mostly the recreational fishery on the firing pan. Um, so that would mean that these releases would not cause the overall release rate of root eye reservoir to exceed 300 CFS or cause the frying pan river flows to exceed 350 CFS. Um, in, addition, in addition, CPW has also recommended ramping rates. So the instantaneous amount of flow at any kind of one gate change doesn't increase too much to cause instability in the river, particularly for anglers. Um, that recommended ramping rate is 50 CFS. Um, and then at higher flows, 250 to 300 CFS, uh, CPW has recommended that those ramping rates decrease to 25 CFS to, to avoid those you know, rapid changes that might create uh, hazards in the river. Um, every August, we present on current and proposed lease operations at the uh, an annual Root Eye Reservoir Operations Meeting hosted by Reclamation, and that meeting is also open to the public. So on costs, uh, last year, the lease costs uh, were $20 an acre foot uh, for the lease with Ute Water and $49.50 per acre foot with Garfield County. Um, there's a large spread in the in the cost uh, of root eye reservoir supplies, and I think that's due to the kind of unique financial circumstances circumstances associated with their repayment contracts with reclamation. Um, so you see that variability. We don't yet have prices uh, uh, for 2023 for this year's leases, but we don't expect a, a large increase. Um, so what we've done is we've estimated say a 3% increase this year uh, that we plan to the funding recommendations that are gonna be shown on the next slide. Um, but again, under these proposals, the entities, Ute Water and Garfield, they set the lease price on an annual year. Uh, we expect that these leases would be paid for through the Species Conservation Trust Fund. Um, that fund is dedicated to uh, projects that conserve native species that are uh, listed as uh, threatened or endangered under federal state law, also for candidate species as well. Um, so the, the bill, the project bill that would authorize funding for this year has been passed by the legislature and is awaiting the governor's signature. Um, one thing to mention, Director Feld, at the last meeting, you asked a question about with respect to the winter uses, that if water had been released in December, would that have been an appropriate use of Species Conservation Trust Fund money? We had a number of discussions internally, including with Councilor Mealy about that, and we've concluded that, yes, this would be okay, um, primarily because the intent is for the 50-mile reach this is just a contingency uh, to, to make sure the water is used. Otherwise, it would just remain in storage. And we're going to make all best efforts to ensure that the water is used for the 15-mile reach as intended. And then each year, we'd like to implement a lease. We will come to the board uh, for a funding request. So as I mentioned, um, this is the second meeting of that two-meeting review process. We do not uh, receive any public comment or request to hold a hearing on this matter. So therefore staff is gonna recommend that the board take action today. Um, the staff recommendation is that uh, to direct staff to execute the proposed water use agreements with the Ute Water Conservancy District and Garfield County in a form subsequently similar to the attached draft agreement. So we did receive some edits on the agreement from Ute Water in the in interim period where we, from when we prepared the board memo. There were no substantive changes. It was just modifications of language to make it more consistent with some of our previous agreements with them. Uh, the second recommendation is to authorize an expenditure of up to $247,200 to implement and fund the short-term annual lease under the agreement with Ute, uh, Ute Water Conservancy District, and then also to authorize an expenditure of up to $16,548 to implement and fund the short-term lease under the agreement with Garfield County. And those numbers come from that 2022 estimate plus the 3% escalator um, as our estimate of what we would be spending this year. So that's the staff recommendation, and I'm happy to um, try and answer any questions that the board may have. Okay, are there questions for Pete? Just, I, oh, go ahead, Director Scott. Okay, um, Pete, just want to confirm, you know, based on that graph you showed of the sort of natural flow or the existing flow and mm -hmm. then the flow, um, I mean, that indicates that you're basically you are 
very clearly able to shepherd this water all the way to the 15 mile reach. And just want to confirm that. Yes, we can. Um, and we um, gotten confirmation from the division engineer that yes, this water will be administrable down to the 15 mile reach. Perfect. Okay, Director Sakai. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Pete, to follow up on that, so for the if the winter flows are utilized, um, are they shepherded down to the 15 mile reach, reach or not? Because they're you're not trying to fulfill it then, are you during the winter months? So typically, um, after the irrigation season, those target flows are met. Um, because the call comes off and the folks are not diverting. So um, that water would not be explicitly shepherded down to the reach, uh, although it would likely get there. Um, the use would be for the frying pan river instrument flow reach. Okay. Any other questions? I do have some, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to look at my notes real quick. Um, just from memory to, because we had talked about this after our last meeting, I think or the meeting before, the different dates that each entity has, I think, to set up the arrangement, the agreement, it seemed like one of them was pretty late. Yeah, and so- that um, creates any complications with us meeting and uh, uh, approving it. Um, yeah, with you, Water, the, the proposed date was July 1st. They would actually like to push that back even to August 1st, um, primarily because uh, the Rudai, their Rudai supplies are a backup supply for their primary water sources. So that they need to kind of be able to judge that they'll be able to part with that water um, and not impair their ability to deliver to their constituents. Um, that being said, the base flow season, you know, extends through October. So um, I think there's time, even if with that late date, to you know be able to utilize that water. Yeah. And then, sorry, one more question. Um, with your final recommendation being total dollar amounts, mm -hmm. did you consider out consider instead putting a price per acre foot? I, so I'm so what I'm saying is if if their price goes way up, uh, you're still okay spending that total amount, but for less water. Um. So the the estimates for those prices include that sort of three percent right. increase per acre foot. Right. So if the price goes up, yeah, we will be paying that you know same amount of money for a little bit less water. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other questions? If not, is there a motion? We've got a motion from Director Anderson. And a second from Director Brown. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Yes, Director. You just Oscar. might want to comment that the people on Zoom have voted with their hands uh, for the record. Okay. Noted. Okay. Next up is item 25. Um, this is the Water Supply Reserve Fund applications for May of 2023. There are a couple of uh, directors with conflicts, I believe. I I am a board member of the Upper Arkansas Water Conservancy District, so I'm going to recuse myself from item A. And then, uh, Director Cloud, did you have a conflict? Yes, I am going to recuse myself of item G for the Nature Conservancy. I am a board trustee for the Nature Conservancy. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have anything? Okay, so, um, and I guess, Ben Wade, you're online to present this, is that right? Yeah, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do um, is we will, I'll step out and Director Bruchet can run the meeting for item A, and you guys can go ahead and decide on that one, and then we'll handle, uh, B, C, D, E, and F, um, either individually or in block, however you prefer, Ben. And then um, item G will handle separately so that Director Cloud can step out. Okay. Yeah, we can do um, A and G separately and then uh, B through F um, as a block. That works for me. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to step out. I'll hand it over to Director Boucher.
Thank you, Chairman Felt. Um, I might have to rely on uh, some of the other directors. Our view of the room in Zoom, I can't see all the directors at the same time. So if somebody has their hand raised, I might need a little guidance there. Um, well, now I need glasses. The zoom out, now I can't see anybody. <laughs> anyway, with that. Can I make uh, a suggestion really quick? I think one, one thing that might be able to help you is if you did a roll call vote so that you didn't have to see everybody, you can actually just call their name. Perfect. Thank you very much. I believe that was Viola. So Ben, agenda item 25A, take it away. Thank you, Director Brichet. For the record, Ben Wade, CWCB staff presenting agenda item number 25. And all these WSRF applications being presented today have been rec recommended for approval uh, from their respective round table. Uh, they met all the matching requirements. Um, real quick, I just wanna thank staff for their, uh, their review on these applications as well as Dory V. Hill and Jeff Rodriguez for help uh, preparing uh, for the board meeting. And um, as the old proverb says, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. So appreciate all the staff helping me out on these um, WSRF applications. We did have 12 applications this round. So we have seven being presented today. Um, so I'll just do a, a quick overview of these proposals. Uh, many of the applicants are online with us, just available to answer any questions the board may have. Um, we had one, as far as statewide requests, we had one drought resiliency uh, proposal. And then uh, the, uh, five of them were for aging infrastructure projects. Uh, we're going to hear four of those um, during today's presentation. Uh, thank you to the board for approving uh, yesterday's grants that were on the consent agenda. Um, and then the remaining two proposals have been sent to Director Mitchell for her approval. Uh, her review and approval. Uh, so 25A was the application from the Upper Arkansas Water Conservancy District. Um, so the request was um, to help the district upgrade some existing data collection platforms to comply with new NOAA, and this is a mouthful, geostationary operational environmental satellite cert certification standards. Um, so not only will they use these grant funds to um, upgrade the existing platforms, but also expand the network into Custer and Chafee counties. Um, the upgrades and the extension will allow the district to accurately measure water supply, tracking water through the delivery system. Uh, they believe it's gonna result in more efficient water use um, and better uh, drought response in the future. Um, staff recommends full approval of the applicant's request. And I did not check earlier, but I believe we have um, George Gertson from the Upper Arc, um, who is available online to ask um, or answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Um, any questions from the board? Hearing no questions, uh, Ben, would your presenter still wanna speak or should we move forward for vote? Uh, we can move forward for the vote. I I um, just asked the applicants just to be on to answer any questions. So I don't, um, they're more than welcome to, but we can continue to move, move forward. All right. Thanks, Ben. Um, so we have staff recommendation. Do we have a motion? Um, Director Boucher, this is Robert Zaccata. I would make a motion to approve. Second. Director Brown. Thank you, Director Sakata and Brown. And then I have never done a roll call Zoom vote. I don't know if it's necessary um, or if we should. Um, I guess I should ask first if there's any further discussion. There's none in the room. Perfect. Uh, this is uh, Director Vasquez. It might be easier to ask for abstentions and no votes and assume yes votes. Um, without any negatives. Thank you, Director uh, Vasquez. Um, I guess we'll give that a go. Are there any, are there any opposed to the yes vote in this uh, recommendation and motion? Hearing none, the assumption is all those in favor, correct? Correct. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Ben. All right. 
Thank you so much. Uh, agenda item 25B is an application from the Colorado River District. And uh, this is a, um, a project that helps expand the Airborne Snow Observatory flight program, um, you know, measuring snowpack. Uh, and we have, uh, in the last board meeting, of course, the board had um, awarded, I think, I think it was three other um, ASO flight proposals. Uh, and I know the board has also supported past um, efforts through different funding sources as well. So this is a continuation and these flights will take place in the frying pan and upper Roaring Fork watersheds, um, as well as trying to expand this into um, other Colorado River Basin watersheds. Um, so I know that um, this is probably a well-known program, but if uh, the staff or if the board has any questions, uh, Dave Kanzer from the Water District is on Zoom with us and um, can answer any questions on this proposal um, or just the project uh, program overall. Um, so these flights would probably take place uh, more likely in the water year of 2024. So just preparing for future flights as um, match funding is allowing them to um, uh, do current flights uh, as as we for this current water year, I should say. So, um, so if the board has any questions, um, Davis here. Uh, otherwise, we can continue to move forward. I actually have a question, and I think it's appropriate sure. after this to turn it over back to Director Felt to chair the meeting. Um, and and Dave, feel free to answer now, or also it's it's more of a general comment to the board. Um, I would love an update to this board July um, or after, but before next snow season as maybe more proposals like this and more spending comes available to uh, the results of this past season and flights in the state and, and how this program is impacting uh, water managers ability to understand snow. So don't feel pressured, Dave, but also feel free to jump in, but just I'd, I'd love to hear how this program is going generally um, as we continue uh, evaluating funding. Thanks. Yeah, I will jump in very briefly and say, uh, really appreciate the support, potential support, ongoing support uh, for this program. We also have Dr. Jeff Deems on the line from ASO Inc., who is doing the work as a contractor, uh, not only to the Colorado River District, but to many other stakeholders throughout the state. Um, but the, another point, um, well, in addition to saying yes, we would love to uh, facilitate an update to, to the CWCB board and staff at any time. Um, it'd be our pleasure to update you all. But um, an, another point on this particular request is we are using this uh, to potentially leverage some federal funding. We submitted a, a grant request to uh, US Bureau of Reclamation um, using some of these. Um, kudos to the staff, Eric Sky and uh, others that it helped us um, get a letter of uh, funding commitment that we use for our application. We should know, uh, I think in the next four to eight weeks uh, on the next step for that, but we requested a, really a, an additional million dollars plus or minus for uh, this area of the headwaters of Colorado. And uh, we are going forward to, to support other grants another million dollars for part of the Gunnison, the North Fork of the Gunnison. So I just wanna make sure that the board members understand that we are uh, using the, these monies um, to expand and leverage state monies uh, to do good things for snow science throughout uh, the state and in particular the, Col the headwaters of the Colorado River Basin. Thank you very much, Dave. And thank you, yeah. Director Bruchet. Um, are there any other questions regarding item B? If not, uh, Ben, I think we can move on to item C. All right, great. Thank you so much. 25C is an application from the Grand Valley Irrigation Company. Um, and uh, this statewide request is the first of the four aging infrastructure, infrastructure projects being presented. Um, currently, there is um, over 3,500 
stretch uh, foot stretch of the 260 lateral in the city of Grand Junction. Uh, this is an aging concrete trapezoidal ditch as about 50 to 60 years old. Um, and currently they're experiencing um, about 45 acre feet of loss due to seepage each year. And so WSRF funds would be used to install pipe, um, you know, cover the cost of construction materials. And their hopes are to reduce future maintenance, uh, improve water quality, um, you know, reducing salt load uh, into the uh, Colorado River and conserve water um, and save um, over $10,000 per year, $10,000 per year, I should say. Um, and staff recommends approval of the applicant's request. Uh, with us today on Zoom is uh, Charles Gunther, the assistant superintendent uh, for the Grand Valley Irrigation Company, as well as Tyler Desiderio from the, and Stephen Morris from the Applegate Group. Um, are also available if the board has any questions for them. Any any questions on item 25C? Okay, I think we can keep going. Great, 25D is an applica application from Trout Unlimited. Um, and so the goal of this project is, just, is to secure and repair the Stuart Mesa Canal diversion structure. Uh, grant funds would be used to aid in water conveyance and delivery to agricultural users and replace the current impaired headgate and in-channel diversion. Um, the board has actually awarded a uh, past WSRF grant and a water plan grant uh, two years ago um, for, the, for this project. And so overall, the total project is over a million. This particular ask is um, just kind of um, just funding a, a specific part of, of the construction so our WS total project cost, um, as we define it in the WSRF grant guidelines, uh, is, is, is lower here. Um, but uh, staff recommends approval of the applicant's request to, uh, to make sure that this uh, diversion structure is fully uh, repaired. Um, and um, Luke uh, Larita with Trout Unlimited um, has joined us on Zoom, and so he's available. Uh, as well as, as uh, I am to answer any questions the board may have on this uh, application. Okay, any questions on 25D? Looks like you've been doing a good job on your written reports here, Ben. <laughs> it's all, it's all Jeff. <laughs> all right. Um, 25E is an application from the Dolores Water Conservancy District. Um, as many of you know, the Dolores McPhee project delivers irrigation water to the traditionally dry land farmers down in uh, the Montezuma and Dolores counties. Um, the producers are required to achieve a high application efficiency from irrigation systems uh, to qualify for water access. Um, but the current systems are older. Um, they're inefficient just after years of irrigating with water from the project, um, just filled with organic solids and soil. And so, um, uh, Dolores Water Conservancy District would use WSRF funds to purchase and install new nozzles and pressure irrigators um, for the producers who are still using aging center pivot systems. Um, they estimate once um, these new nozzles and uh, regulators are, are installed that they would save about 367 acre feet per year um, in savings. And uh, Ken Curtis uh, from the district is on Zoom and is available to answer any questions the board may have on this uh, proposal. All right, are there any you, questions? Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say hi to Ken. You guys are busy up there. Hope things are going okay. Looks like a cool project. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Director Combs. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering on a, on a nozzle link project, um, how do you ensure that we don't just increase the consumptive use, but there is the savings of that acre feet? Is there any kind of control for that? Or is that just estimated that that savings can then be reapplied to that same ground? May I? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Curtis. Um, yes, Director. Uh, we have allocations to individual farmers. They may control more than one field. 
uh, any wa saved water could remain under their control. So it's not absolutely guaranteed to um, save consumptive use depending on the year, particularly in shortage years, uh, we're always short. Uh, it could be reapplied in another field or just used more effectively to extend the season. So those farmers do have an allocation about 22 inches um, and if they save water they can apply it uh, later or in other uses other fields in their pools yeah go ahead director combs so, so then it, it's possible that they could actually finish their crops right if, in the dry years they the savings on the initial irrigations leave enough for them to finish a crop in any particular season is that what you were saying uh, certainly in a short year, it would extend what they could apply. And in a normal year, depending on the natural precipitation, 22 inches is slightly under the irrigation requirement here. So it might finish out. Um, it, in a particularly wet year, saved water probably remains in storage in McPhee. Yes, please. Thank you. Any other questions, Director Combs? All right. And thanks, Ken. <clears throat> uh, Chair Felt? Yeah. Just as a public announcement, flows remain releasing out of McPhee at 4,000 CFS. Rafting is beautiful. Please join us if you can. <laughs> I was talking to somebody recently about uh, Snaggletooth Rapid and how how challenging it was and they were sort of poo-pooing it and it dawned on me that when I was doing my most of my many trips down there we were running 16 foot bucket boats not the 14 foot self bailers that everybody's in now and um, 4,000 is is a serious trip in those old school rafts so <laughs> hopefully you'll get plenty of visitors over the weeks ahead Okay, um, if there's nothing else on item 25E, um, then let's move on to 25F. Absolutely, uh, 25F uh, is an application from the city of Craig and the city has a vision uh, to create a cohesive park system um, south of the city along the Yampa River. Um, so this particular grant would be applied towards the construction of the in-stream improvements at the Whitewater Park, uh, specifically the drop structures. Um, this is another one where overall, it's a much larger project, um, just under 5 million, but um, what WSRF would be uh, supporting um, as a much lower, quote unquote, WSRF total project cost of 1 million. Um, but yeah, just overall, the project consists of improvements at Loudy Simpson Park to construct a boat ramp, um, uh, make a fish friendly in channel recreational feature, and then um, as well as provide onshore amenities to create the beginnings of an integrated river water, uh, river park complex. Um, this has been um, on the Riampa White Green Basin Implementation Plan, um, not only in the updated, but uh, going dating back to 2015. So um, good to see that this is being um, proposed and, and moving forward here. Uh, we do have Melanie Kirkpatrick with the city um, on Zoom uh, to answer any questions the board may have. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, are there any questions on 25F, Director Cicada? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it sounds really exciting, and uh, I can hardly wait to be able to go down there to see this. On the applications itself, and we've talked in the past a little bit about this, about not documenting any measurable results. You know, I think it'd be good to have that filled in so people that are just reading the application have an idea of, of what these improvements mean to the community and who will be, be benefiting. So um, if you want to speak to it a little bit right now, that would I would appreciate it. Yes, um, thank you. So um, as far as measurable results, the project is largely economic development. Um, we do have a large $3.3 million economic development administration grant. Um, and that does require us to track economic impact over the next nine years after project implementation. 
think we're still looking at how to um, track um, visitation. Um, it is reconstructing our municipal water intake um, dam structure. Um, and so we're constantly monitoring that site to ensure that we're able to provide water to the city of Craig residents as well. Thank you, Melanie. And then Wade, um, the statewide is for aging infrastructure. Is that right? That's, that's what it would fall under then? Yeah, that's what this would fall under, yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? If not, is there a motion to approve items 25B through F? Motion for Director Brown. Uh, yeah, why aren't we doing the next one too? Because Director Cloud has oh, a- sorry. Uh, sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. that. Um, yes, I would like to make that motion and just thank Melanie for being on and for all your work on this project. I mentioned this is the corridor project I mentioned in my director's report, so thank you. Awesome. And Director Sakata? Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve items 25B through F. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, okay motion carries. Um, so item 25G, Director Cloud, um, if you'll just put your fingers in your ears for a few minutes, uh, we'll, we'll move forward with that one. Ben? All right, <clears throat> excuse me. 25G is an application from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and different parts of this project have been funded uh, uh, by the CWCB board uh, over the past five years. Um, so mixed in there is, excuse me. Mixed in were um, past WSRF and I believe one water plan grant. Um, but the Maybell diversion is the largest diversion um, on the Yampa serving 18 producers. Um, and over uh, 1,200 acres of hay pasture. Um, so this current proposal will just uh, help cover some increased costs uh, of materials and construction on the Maybell Diversion and Headgate. Um, uh, Nature Conservancy states that constructing this new diversion will provide agricultural water security and allow passage of fish and paddlers at a location that previously has impeded fish movement, as well as posed, uh, posed a boating hazard. Um, with us today is Jennifer Wellman uh, from the Nature Conservancy. Um, she's with us today to answer any questions uh, the board may have on this project. Okay, are there any questions on 25G? Nope. Oh. Yes, Director Brown. I just wanna uh, thank Jennifer and I think I saw Mike Camblin come on too. Um, if, do you wanna say anything about the project while we've got you guys on? Good morning. No, I'm happy to and to answer any questions. We are wrapping up our NEPA process through the Bureau of Land Management and hope to go to construction this fall. And later summer, we have to do some construction state staging. So um, we've really been grateful for the CWCB's past support of this project. And this will help fill the last remaining funding gap in an otherwise um, very well-funded project through a variety of sources, including Bureau of Reclamation Recovery Program, the Colorado River District, CWCB, private donors. We have been um, active over the last four years of fundraising, so it's great to see this project come to fruition. Mike, do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, I'll just throw in my two cents. I This week is a really good example of why we need this is uh, there's so much water running through there and it's just about ready to breach the head gates now. And this project will raise those head gates. And so we're afraid to even send Dave up there to adjust it because if he's up there when it breaches, you know, we'll lose a man. And so um, this this is this will be really good to have this finished up. We're pretty excited. Thank you to you both. These both of them have worked incredibly hard on this project. So we're really excited to see it move into the construction phase. Nice to see you. Thank you. 
Right. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Is there anybody else with any questions or comments? If not, is there a motion to approve 25G? Yes. Director Brown. I so Second, move. Director Vasquez. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Motion carries. Um, it's only 11.15. I would propose that we continue with the agenda, and that'll introduce a little more flexibility in everyone's day. Did you have a comment, Director Sakata? Yes, I mean, thank you. Yes. Very, thank you, Chair. Um, ben, I hope you're still on. Um, I really wanted to thank you and the staff for this, and I appreciate during your presentations how you talk about it being a bigger project. I know there was a lot of concern around the state how we're going to fill in that criteria, the 10% criteria of the match for the basins, and it sounds Sounds like you guys have been working with them, you know, on these bigger projects to divide out what's appropriate for, to meet that match. And so I uh, really appreciate you guys working on that and making it work. But but I also, in your presentations, like to know when it's a part of a bigger project, because then we have a better understanding of, you know, the, what it all entails and who's all involved. It gives us a better idea of what's going on there. So thanks, Ben. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Director Sakata. Thank you. All right. Yes, Director Vasquez. I have a question for you, Ben, and, and it's a dumb one. Uh, what determines from the staff's perspective what goes on the consent agenda versus what is presented individually for water supply reserve account? Funds? Mr. Chair, if my, if yeah. I, may, I don't know if anybody has contacted Director Cloud um, to have her come back on, and these oh. are, seem like general interest items. I don't, I don't have her. I think I have her number. Do you? I, she has to be last. Very well. Let's see. I can go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I don't have her number. Okay. Thank you, Director Mitchell. So, Ben, you have my question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <clears throat> not a dumb question at all. Um, yeah. So, this is a. Uh, um, Oh, I can't remember. I think it was May of last year. Um, uh, the board adopted uh, policy number twenty-five, which which um, um, kind of broke up uh, depending on what the funding request was from the applicant. So anything that is fifty thousand dollars and below for a grant request um, goes to the CWCB di director for approval. Uh, Five thousand or fifty thousand and one dollar up to ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine um, goes on a the board's consent agenda, and then anything a thousand, a hundred thousand, and and um, north of that um, is a CWCB board presentation, um, and that's how that's determined. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions for Ben? All right. Thank you, Ben. All right. Thank you. So let's move on to item 26, which is fiscal year 23-24 water plan grant funding by category. Anna. Thanks for the record, Anna Moss, CWCB staff. So um, as you said, this is the water plan grant funding distribution for the upcoming fiscal year. We're fortunate to have 25.2 million available thanks to the appropriation in the projects bill. And that's made up of a combination of sports buying revenue, some construction fund revenue and some severance tax revenues. So um, it's, it's a large amount of money. I think we can do um, a lot of good projects in the upcoming year. Um, part of what I wanted to bring before you now is really looking ahead to give grantees an idea of how we think we should break this down. It's kind of hard when folks come into us and ask questions, they want to apply for funding, how much is available, that's, that's just a big number. And so breaking this down gives a little bit of some sidewalls so, so people understand um, where we're trying to direct um, grants going forward. Certainly you all retain flexibility, we can be nimble with this. Um, when the grant program first started, the appropriations were tied to those funding categories. Um, but with the creation of the Water Plan Implementation Cash Fund, which is now in statute, um, and those categories are defined in statute, now money goes into that fund and you all have the flexibility within that fund to award um, based on those demands that we see. And I know last year when we talked through this, um, there were some ideas that maybe we ought to not look at historically how we had divided things, but maybe consider different options. So I wanted to acknowledge that. We definitely heard that. 
Um, yesterday, when Greg Belomo was talking about our operational plan, that's something that we will certainly tackle with him going forward. Um, he mentioned that the funding framework within the operational plan, and that gives us an opportunity to talk to you about how we establish some guidelines for future distributions. So we'll, it'll be, I think, on our radar for the upcoming um, interviews, the workshop, finance committees. So this is not just a, a one-time conversation, but it's important to, I think, set some sidewalls now for grantees looking at that July 1 application deadline. So what we did was we looked at what were our most recent demands in categories? Where are we seeing traction in projects? And took those demands and really forecasted up based on the new amount of funding we have for next fiscal year. So on the slide here, you, you see how we are suggesting that we break down um, the targeted funding available. And again, within the staff recommendation too, I did caveat that, that this still allows you to be flexible. So if we get more demand in a certain area and you think there's a really worthwhile project, we still have that opportunity, but this just creates a little bit of guidance for grantees. So with that, um, I'll happily answer any questions if you have any. Okay, are there questions for Anna? Yes, Director Vasquez. I just want to make a comment. Thank you for this uh, presentation. I had asked uh, Viola yesterday whether she would post all the PowerPoints that we see in our meetings to the common Google Drive. So in particular this, if you wanna be able to communicate it to your roundtables, uh, you will actually have the presentation in the Google Drive. Great. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Make sure my microphone's on. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, I guess, highlight the fact that this is a really unprecedented historic amount of funding um, that we now have to get out the door. <laughs> and, um, you know, thanks to last year's budget process, we now have additional grant managers out on the ground. And I just want to recognize the hard work that they're doing because this really is a lot of money. And um, I think we we really appreciate and need their help on the front end and uh, helping applicants and identifying projects proactively. So just a shout out to those folks and all the reports I get back from all the work that you're doing in the basin has been nothing but positive. So now you just have to double down and get rid of twice as, as much money. So <laughs> thank you. It is. Mr. Chair. Yes, Director Scott. Yeah, I would like to build on that too. Hi, Laura. Laura Spann's one of them on online. I see her online whenever she presents. She always accuses me of being online watching her. So hi, Laura. Thanks. Thanks all of you guys for all the work that you're doing. Okay. And I'm sorry, was this an action item for It today? is, yes. Okay, yeah. Just making yep. sure. Okay. Director Combs? So I'd move for approval of act, uh, staff's recommendation on uh, item 26. Second. Okay. Second, Director Brown. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Um, okay. Anna, I, yeah. I was told maybe this next item is pulled, but then... You... It's going to be real brief. It's, yeah. it's abridged is maybe okay. a better abridged that description. Yes. <laughs> so again, Anna Moss, CWCB staff. So this is the Diane Hoppy Memorial Scholarship uh, it is an abridged um, version today. Um, I had invited last year's recipient and she was going to give you all a presentation and um, she got real busy with schoolwork and her job and said, you know, next year she's gonna dive even deeper into water issues. And so she asked if she could come back next year with even a more robust presentation to you all. Um, and I just have a soft spot in my heart for people who are working really hard, multiple jobs and school and all those things. And I said, that sounds great. So <laughs> hope that you all are okay with that decision too. Uh, so for that reason, this is a much abridged presentation. Um, just as a little bit of background, Diane Happy was a um, South Platte representative on this board. She was also in the Colorado House of Representatives, uh, a founding member of WECO, which is sort of timely with our, our next presentation. She was actually president of WECO for their founding years. So she was an incredible woman. Um, her family established this scholarship um, after she passed away in 2016. It's a $2,000 grant that goes to either a um, applicants can be freshmen in college or um, high school seniors who are interested in studying Western water issues. So um, it's always a tough decision. I love reading the applications every year because there's so much optimism and enthusiasm from these applications. And you want to say yes to every single one. They're, they're incredible students um, and it's a hard decision. So we have a, a big uh, team on our staff who gets together as a review committee. And it's, it's an interesting process and always a tough decision. Um, this year we selected, you can see in your um, board packet, student two. He will be a freshman at 
um, CSU, studying environmental engineering, and he had a really interesting story. Um, and we always redact their information just for privacy of the students, so that's why we just refer to them as a, a student number. Um, but he currently is working as a water treatment operator for the city of Brush. And so after he went to high school, he went and got an operator's license to save money, to work really hard, to get to afford to go to college. And it was a really interesting story of how he's um, very involved in this community. He's first generation student, the first one in his family to um, pursue a higher ed degree. He also likes to teach his coworkers chemistry classes twice a month. He does a little a lunch and learn, which I thought was just a really interesting opportunity and, um, and it shows leadership at a very young age. So for that reason, uh, we selected that particular student, not an easy decision. I mean, there was, there was really incredible applications across the board, but that's what staff is recommending. So with that, you've got our recommendation. Okay, thank you, Anna. Are there any questions or thoughts to share with her on this? If not, is there, yes, Director Brown? Thank you so much. And thanks to the Diane Hoppy family for providing this. It's really neat. And it's always great to see uh, students um, going forward with a career in water. So thanks for your time on it. And um, with that, I would move st staff recommendation. Nope. Oh. Yep. Yeah, I see it. Um, yeah, let's hold the motion. Is that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Let's just hear what they have to say, and then we'll we'll let the motion stand. Um, so I've got. Uh, let's go to Director Bruchet. Do you have comments? Yeah. Thanks, Chairman Felt. I just, uh, and I'm sorry to bust up the motion there. I just. I think it's pretty cool to see on your face, Anna, the excitement of talking about it, you know, giving uh, kids, youth, uh, these students opportunity is something that always feels good. And it's neat to see, you know, your face highlighted in reading the excitement of all of the applications and that really getting the next generation involved in these resources is a very neat thing. So thank you. Thank you. And Director Mitchell. Um, I, I, First of all, I just wanted to thank Anna for her work on this. I don't, um, I don't think um, this was, you know, giving out scholarships is not something that's in anybody's job description, but I know that this was incredibly important for Diane Hoppy's family. Um, Diane was a mentor to me. So every year when this one comes up, I get um, extremely excited. This year, especially when you look at this application, um, it it encapsulates um i think what diane would have wanted um very much so so um i again i just wanted to thank the staff involved for this and and um we look forward to working with all these people that have gotten this scholarship at some point in the future uh because i think it we've done a really good job of choosing and looking at people that are are going to be leaders in the future. And so our paths will cross. And that's awesome. it, thank you. That's a great sentiment. Thank you, Director Mitchell. Um, we, have, we do have a motion on the floor from Director Brown and a second from Director Vasquez. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. All right, and now we'll go to item 28, which is the uh, Water Education Colorado Annual Allocation Scope with Elizabeth Schoeder. One second.
Good afternoon and thank you, Elizabeth Scoder, CWCB staff for the record. I'm here for agenda item 28, Water Education Colorado's annual allocation and scope of work review. This is an action item for the board. The staff recommendation for the board is to approve the proposed fiscal year 2024 scope of work for Water Education Colorado or WECO. As a brief bit of background, as many of you know, we have worked for many years, about 20 with WECO since it was founded in 2002. We've partnered with them in a number of ways and have typically supported them with an annual appropriation in the amount of $150,000 as a grant from the construction fund through the projects bill. I'll turn it over to Jayla to speak more to the details of the scope, but the scope does support a number of WECO initiatives through various educational programs, outreach efforts, and operational support. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jayla Poppleton, WECO's Executive Director. Welcome, Jayla. Thank you, Elizabeth, and hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here with you today. Um, exciting to see the new directors. Congratulations, including Director Cloud. Uh, so each year we come before you um, at this time of the year to report out on the work that we've done uh, that was supported by the scope of work in the previous year. And then we present the scope um, in, in terms of how those state funds are, are going to be allocated across um, our operations and programs for the coming year and seek your support. And so I'm going to be um, presenting this where I share with you the activities from fiscal year 2023, but also highlight the activities that have been historically supported through the scope of work and, and those that we're going to be proposing for the coming year. Let's see if I can get this to work. Very good. Okay. All right. So few, uh, first, there's a few quick highlights from the past year. Um, a, a big part of our year was completing the second half of the Water 22 public awareness campaign, which was a year-long campaign dedicated to the idea that it all starts here with our water and each of us and our individual commitments. We also offered an extended tour. Our annual river basin tour was um, spanned three days last year and highlighted the Upper Colorado River Basin as part of the 100th anniversary of the Colorado River Compact. In addition to that, we had a really busy year conducting eight mini tours connected to the Water 22 cam campaign in each of the state's river basins working with the roundtables um, as part of the Colorado Water Plan update. We also moved our offices to the new CSU Spur Hydro Building. Really excited to be there. We moved in January and we've just gotten settled in and we're looking forward to opportunities to collaborate and also just raise our profile to the public and help them um, become aware of who we are and the resources that we offer. We also produced the first two Spanish language citizens now called community guides in our series, our 10 guide library. And so we focused on the citizen's guide to where your water comes from and the guide to Colorado water law. And then we held a series of water workshops for legislators with all of the, the new legislators working at the Capitol. We partnered with Colorado Water Congress, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it was called De Demystifying um, Colorado Water for Legislators. And we had a, a really great um, showing, a really great attendance at those sessions. The first one, our Water 101 was held that very first week of the session. Um, again, partnered with Colorado Water Congress. We had a lot of uh, CWCB representatives and staff actually present on some of your programs. Um, because of the, the turnout there and the demand for the information, we decided to host a 201 series. So we went into um, three additional sessions focused on the Colorado River Compact and Director Mitchell presented there along with Ann Castle. We also had one in March um, on Colorado Ag Day in partnership with the Colorado Department of Agriculture on agricultural water needs and solutions. And then we concluded in April with one on municipal water efficiency, growth and land use. Those are all recorded and posted on our website. Um, so we're just trying to make sure that people are aware of that and can take advantage of that as a resource. Um, in terms of the Water 22 campaign activities, um, hopefully you all followed that. Some of you were part of it. Um, but just a summary of what we did over the course of the year. You know, there was a, a website for the campaign, branding, messaging, a marketing toolkit for all of our partners working across the state to share and really ele elevate the visibility of the campaign with a shared message. 
We had monthly celebrity um, public service announcements and other media outreach. Um, there's a photo here um, of Chairman Manuel Hart from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. So he gave our November PSA um, and lent his voice to the campaign, which was really exciting to see. We had a statewide book club, a speakers bureau. We led a student water awareness week um, and a student showcase that I'll talk about in a minute. There was tabling, partner events, film festivals, river festivals. So the campaign really got out on the ground through the activation of partners. Uh, there were also brew events. We distributed 10,000 beer coasters to breweries that said it takes great water to make great beer and pointed people to the campaign and the website. And then we had a professional PR team and media outreach um, that really helped us get out on news channels and in um, news media uh, about various activities, including what you can see here. We, we highlighted Stormwater Awareness Week in October. Um, the campaign was bilingual, so we had published um, English and Spanish materials and hosted events that had interpreters, and um, that was really a big step forward for Water Education Colorado and a, and a learning curve um, to, to really see what level of resources it takes to accomplish that. So final recap, um, we distributed 10,000 English and 5,000 Spanish 22 ways to care for Colorado water flyers. Um, 10,000 of the coasters to breweries. We had 12,000 unique visitors to the website, 36,000 impressions for the PSAs. Um, that was really boosted by having one of those PSAs played at Coors Field. Um, it was the Coors Field groundskeeper um, talking about how they use and manage water and some of the, the work that they've done to return flows to the Colorado River. Um, we had more than a thousand people at the book club events. Uh, there's one there um, at the top of the page um, that was hosted in Durango in November. Uh, more than 54 media stories with an estimated um, 40 million reach in terms of individual potential reader, viewer, or listener exposure, and then thousands of more touches via those partner events. We do have a campaign highlight reel that you can view on YouTube. Um, that really just gives you a snapshot of what all the energy and momentum behind that campaign last year. Uh, the mini tours was something that we did um, in partnership with the CWCB and the Basin Roundtables. So we visited eight out of the nine basins. We regretted um, not to get to the North Platte, and there were some reasons for that. Um, but we visited the South Platte, the Gunnison and the Metro, et cetera. You can see the schedule here. I'm thankful to those in the room, um, including Director Coombs who participated in those. Um, the videos that we, we produced in conjunction with that are gonna be ready by June 1st. Um, we're gonna be hosting kind of a watch party and also distributing those to the Basin Roundtables for them to use if they'd like as part of their outreach and also sharing those with the CWCB. And, and I'll just say the goal of those mini tours was really to highlight um, the Basin Roundtables and their role in the basins, their priorities, the work that they had done on their Basin Implementation Plan updates, and how that was feeding into the Colorado Water Plan process. Um, other activities are, are kind of standard um, flagship programs, the Water Leaders Program. We've had 222 graduates now since 2006. I see at least half a dozen people in this room who've gone through the program and said it, including some of you at the table here. Um, the two, 2022 class graduated in September. Um, we had several um, folks from the state agencies participating as mentors. So thank you so much to um, Director Mitchell, Director Gibbs, um, Commissioner Greenberg, and also to Kelly romero Heaney for serving in that role. It's really um, a key piece of the program that um, the, the class members are paired with mentors in the field um, to benefit from leadership, leadership lessons that they can impart. And thank you to Director Felt for um, being one of our leaders unplugged during the session held in Salida. Um, that was just something that our class members talked about for days. Um, they just really appreciated everything that you shared with them there. The 2023 program just kicked off. Um, and actually I have this date wrong, it was April 27th. Um, Brandy Logan from the CWCB staff is participating this year. And this is one of those activities that is historically supported by the scope and we've included it again this year. Um, the water fluency program has been, it's in its ninth year this year. And we've had 273 participants go through it since 2015. The 2022 program um, focused on the Gunnison Basin and concluded in August. 
And um, you can see some photos here from that session. Um, Kate Ryan from the Water Trust was presenting to the group about the Amstream Flow Program. So we're highlighting that work. And then we were out at Blue Mesa Reservoir talking about some of the drought response operations agreement um, impacts and what's happening on the Colorado River with the class as one of our site visits. This year, we're going to be visiting the Rio Grande Basin. Uh, the program is held hybridly, but we feature case studies from a river basin and will be in Alamosa in July. So looking forward to that. Um, Katie Weeman, who's a new um, board member for Water Education Colorado representing the CWCB, is going to be auditing the program this year. And this is another activity that's historically supported by the scope of work. Uh, the Water Educator Network, um, this is a way that we work to um, support and increase the capacity and offer professional development to other water educators working with various audiences across the state. Um, this has been active since 2014. It's an affiliate program, and so we're offering tools, trainings, resources, and places and spaces for people to collaborate and identify those collaborations, um, working with similar audiences on similar programs and towards shared goals. So just an example of that, we hosted our annual water festival, this children's water festival coordinators workshop in February. Um, there's a photo there of the, the first annual Yampa River water festival. And we had some of the folks that worked on that present to our group, um, some of the strategies that they employed to make that such a huge success. We're also the host institution for a national program called Project WET or Water Education um, today, which is a curriculum that's aligned with state standards that um, educators can use in the classroom and also in non-formal education settings. And so as the host institution, um, we offer um, trainings for educators and also for facilitators who want to go train other educators. And we're going to be offering two educator trainings in June. And then we also uh, maintain a facilitator network and we report out on the activities that we're aware of um, that people report to us to that, that national network. Um, and so that's, that's an important role that we play that we're really looking to expand. This is also historically supported by the scope of work. Um, our tours, and you heard Director Brown mention this, um, every year we host a river basin tour in a different river basin. We rotate those around the state. As mentioned last year, we focused on the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, that was in June a really great tour. Uh, the photos here are from that tour down in Palisade and then a stop that we made in Winter Park and heard from state officials about the Colorado River Compact. Um, this year we're fo focusing on the Yampa right, White Green, really excited about that and sounds like we are going to be seeing some high water and some excitement. Um, the Inter Interim Water Resources Review Committee is sending um, the majority of their committee and some of their staff on the tour with us. So we're really excited about that. And then we also um, offer one seat as part of our scope of work to CWCB on the bus and of course um, coordinate with state staff um, as fits on the different tour topics to be presenters. And then next year in the scope of work, what you'll see is um, we're proposing to feature the upper Arkansas River Basin. Uh, in terms of our publications, we're still publishing three issues of Headwaters each year, plus complementary content. Um, this year, we focused on an issue on the federal nexus with Colorado water management. We just published an issue on the Colorado water plan update, which hopefully you all received. You should be on our mailing list, but if you're not, I'll make sure to adjust that. Um, and then our final issue for the year is going to be featuring natural infrastructure and river restoration activities um, so that will come out in late June, early July. Um, in addition, this year, I mentioned the Spanish community guides. Um, there's a photo there of the cover of the Where Your Water Comes From guide. Um, and then in the fiscal year 2024 scope of work, we're looking at expanding and really testing the market for these guides and the distribution channels to get these to uh, the target audience. Um, and then we'll be updating our citizen's guide to Colorado water conservation. And while we're at it, we're going to publish that in English and Spanish. Uh, in terms of that complimentary content I, I mentioned, we always host a webinar following the publication of each issue of Headwaters to dive deeper into the topics and bring some of the folks who were interviewed out to discuss um, the programs and projects that they're involved in. 
And so this year, kind of working backwards, the webinars that we've hosted so far um, featured the, the endangered fish recovery programs and that followed the issue on the federal nexus. We also had back in December, um, a webinar focused on soil health and water that, that followed our summer issue of headwaters from last year that, that was looking at sustainable agriculture for Colorado. And then in, in October, um, this was a little bit outside of that, we hosted a Water Law 101 partnering with the Colorado Municipal League. And those are all available as recordings on our website. And then I'll just mention a couple of the other activities that we do um, that aren't in the scope of work. And so one is Freshwater News, which is an initiative that we launched in July 2018. It's guided by an ed editorial advisory board of media professionals. Um, it's weekly original reporting uh, emailed out in a news report along with um, kind of a news digest. We have media partners that are republishing articles across the state, a membership in and awards from the Colorado Press Association. And um, currently we're looking at exploring and testing in a six month pilot, a collaborative partnership with a news partner that would help accomplish a few things for freshwater news. One. Um, expand audience reach um, to increase the amount of reporting uh, to really keep up with all that's happening in Colorado water. And then three, um, to create greater distance from WECO and the other programs and collaborations that we have. And then the Sustaining Colorado Watersheds Conference is another one. Um, this has not historically been supported by the scope of work. However, the CWCB has supported the conference through a sponsorship. Uh, we, we partner with the Colorado Riparian Association and Colorado Watershed Assembly to host this annual event. Um, about 300 people come, a wide variety of different professionals working on sustaining our watersheds. This, um, this year's theme is Beyond the Banks, Expanding Perspectives to Change Our World, and it's scheduled for October 3rd through the 5th in Avon. And I encourage you all to come out to that. Um, so moving into the proposed scope of work, you have kind of the narrative in your packet, as well as this table that I've kind of excerpted by task. And so it's really similar to what you saw last year. The biggest change is that um, we don't have Water 22. So last year we moved funds from different buckets to supporting the campaign, and this year we kind of moved them back. So uh, in terms of task one, this is operational support. Um, $12,500 for strategic plan implementation, just financial management and reporting that we do as an organization, and then really critical maintaining um, the integrity and value of our web platform as a key tool for communicating out um, everything that we do. Um, task two being public outreach. This is where Water 22 lived last year. Um, but always um, we're engaged in some form of general public outreach. And so we've broken that into two subtasks this year. Um, the first is really being a partner um, and providing information as requested and as opportunities arise to community groups and conferences, um, promoting educational opportunities and resources from others through our channels on our events calendar and in our newsletter. And then um, what we've, we've kind of lumped this in here, and this is really more significant than this really um, demonstrates the, the educational opportunities to legislators. We want to keep doing um, the level of work that we did this year and actually also explore um, working with other elected officials, including county commissioners. And so Director Felt, um, something I'd love to speak with you about, because I know you're really active in that space. And then the second subtask would be just participation in collaborative groups. Um, we're invited to, to do this, and this is just something that takes a, a lot of time and resources. Um, we support the Equity, Diver Diversity, and Inclusion Work Group of the Colorado Water Congress. We advise on SPURS Water in the West Conference. Um, we participate in the Basin Roundtables and specifically their PEPO activities in the statewide PEPO group, um, the South Platte Urban Waters Partnership, Water and Land Use Alliance, et cetera. And then we're also, you know, making ourselves available to support organizations with miscellaneous opportunities. So an example of that is um, this year on um, Earth Day, there were lots of activities taking place at CSU Spur, including a rain barrel building workshop. And so they tapped WECO for our expertise in putting on those types of programs in the past, and we supported. Um, task three is um, the education and leadership program. So water fluency, water leaders, the water educator network and the annual river basin tour, which we've already really touched on. I would say 
Uh, the biggest differences here are with the water fluency program. We've had such a demand for this program right now. We capped the class size at 35 people, and we'd like to be able to serve more people than that as interest continues to grow. And so one thing that we've included here is scoping out the possibility for running two sessions in 2024. Um, this would be dependent on developing a strong partner <laughs> to give us the cap capacity to accomplish that. And we're currently in a conversation um, with a potential partner around that. And then with water leaders, one thing I'll call out is that um, this year, as the first year that we've increased the class size to 20, um, up from 16. Um, so just really trying to, again, meet the demand. And even with that, we had um, to turn 50% of the people who applied away. Um, so we will maintain that that expanded class size so far, so good with just 25% of the way through this year. And then we're going to be, once again, offering a 201 level sort of shore up opportunity for alumni, which is something that we haven't done um, since COVID. Okay, last one. In the content programs, um, this is again really standard. We're proposing three issues of headwaters featuring the topics of one water this fall, uh, snowpack in the spring, and industrial water use next summer. And these topics are identified by our publications committee, which includes WECO board members, um, as well as some non-board members that participate as volunteers. Um, we'll have the complimentary content um, connected to those headwaters topics. And then with regard to the community citizens guide series, again, that Colorado water conservation guide update that was last published in 2015. So lots of new content to explore there in that update. And then we'll be focusing on that distribution and evaluation of demand for the Spanish community guides. So I didn't, wanted to thank you all for your support. Um, this is a photo from the water plan launched party back in January when you guys awarded us with a community hero award, which we sincerely appreciated um, for the work that we had done the previous year in Water 22. It was a big year. And um, you know, with everything that uh, WECO has experienced some turnover in our organization, we're stretched pretty thin but we are regrouping and I, and I wanna quickly um, introduce or point out a new team member, Jeff Harlan, who is our new membership and development manager, two weeks on the job. Um, so please, if you get a chance after the meeting today, um, introduce yourself to him. So any questions? Wow, that was a lot, Jayla, <laughs> very impressive. Uh, I know Director Brown has a question or comment. Thanks. Um, in your slideshow, it said that your headwaters industry edition was this summer, but in your written report, it said 2024. Can you okay. clarify? Yeah, sorry for that, Director Brown. That should be summer of 2024. Great. Thanks. Okay. Are there other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Thank you, Jayla, for all of your hard work. I just wanted to highlight for the, the new board members and maybe just a reminder for the ongoing um, board, I won't call you old. <laughs> You're not young, young at heart. Um, for just the uniqueness of the relationship that the CWCB has with, with WECO, I think it might be the only situation where there's a basically a direct appropriation out of our construction fund that goes mm -hmm. to WECO on an annual basis. Um, it's called a continuous appropriation um, in legislative jargon. And, you know, I just think that really speaks to um, the importance of us working in tandem um, and continuing to do that. You know, I think we have a strong history um, while we each have our own individual missions and programs um, that we're really working towards the same end um, mm -hmm. and making sure that we have an educated citizenry of, of Colorado. So I just wanted to highlight that, that this is, this is a really unique and important relationship that we have with WECO. Um, and so this, this here is the board's role in approving the scope of work for, for money that's essentially already been appropriated to the organization. So thank you. Thanks for that, Lauren. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jayla. That was a great presentation. Um, and uh, uh, some of you know, I, I serve on the WECO board representing the Department of Natural Resources. 
And it's been such a pleasure um, to be mm -hmm. able to play that role with WECO since I have my own history with WECO as a water leaders grad in 2016. And, um, uh, but I also really want to compliment uh, WECO on the great work with the legislator um, series, um, the Water 101 and the 201s. And I, I know there are a lot of work, but I'm really hopeful that they will continue because I think that really helps us do our work um, with the legislature, the more that there's that baseline understanding of how water works. Mm -hmm. um, so we really appreciate uh, the, um, all that you did there. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Director Boucher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jayla, for a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to tell the board, if you're ever invited to participate in a bus tour, face backwards on a bus leaving Windy Gap, go through Byers Canyon, relatively windy. I think the bus driver was pinning it pretty well. Hard left turn on County Road 39 and then take you on 33. That was the most fearful ride of my entire life. So both exciting and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> well, <laughs> we had, we did have a harrowing drive um, later on the tour, kind of coming the back way down to um, Blue Mesa, and um, Kathleen Curry actually expressed some trepidation around the route that we had selected, but it was for, it kind of forced our hand because 50 was closed um, for construction between Montrose and Gunnison. And uh, the bus driver did so well that we special requested him back this year. So um, we will we will have a hearty soul driving our bus, and you can count on him. <laughs> okay. Are there other comments, Director Sakata? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great work, Jayla. It's an uh, amazing water. Twenty two was really spectacular. So I know it was a lot of work for everybody. That's fantastic. Um, you know, in my board presentation, I had a slide of the Erie. Town Festival, uh, which was last Saturday. I got to, um, I was there to pick, meet somebody else and actually stayed and walked through the community. And and um, I'm just wondering if there's opportunity for organizations really to participate in events like that. Mm -hmm. I think I saw Northern Water actually had a booth there. Eric Brown was there, you know, right across from there was this, the city of Erie. And then they had their open space program there. Mm -hmm. And just the number of people that were walking through there was just incredible. And I'm, you know, that's, we often see the booths at water events, but we're all water wonks. Maybe we need to reach out to those other areas. And so maybe that's part of the, the WEN network or, you know, as, as a board member of CWCB had a booth, I'd be willing to take it on the road, take it on the road with me, if you could trust me. <laughs> yeah. Forget the truck. We're going to get you an RV. <laughs> nice, exactly. I love it. Uh, but that's just an idea I'll mm -hmm. throw out there to you because it was it was really fun to participate and see that event and, and what's going on. So thank you. Absolutely. Director Vest. I volunteered to participate in the Cicada Roadshow. <laughs> I kind of see I already got some groupies. <laughs> Other comments? Questions? I'd move. I well, I'll just say, um, Jayla, I really appreciate being included in some of those things you described. Um it was very memorable for me too, um, having people kind of probe you a little bit about, you know, what you think or how you got to those conclusions and and that kind of thing is, uh, it's a growth opportunity for your your speakers and um, mentors and folks like that, as well as the people in the program. So I just um, would echo what Kelly said and encourage if anyone gets the opportunity to be a part of these things to do it because um, it is it is very rewarding. So thank you. Thank you for that. And then um, was that Director Sakata? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move staff recommendation for agenda item 28. Okay. Director Vasquez, that's a second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the continuing allocation. Is that right? Appropriation. Appropriation. Okay, so close. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Jill. very much. Yeah. Um, Viola, do we have any public comment? No. no. Is there anything 
else for the good of the order? All right, Mr. Chair. We have lunch ready now. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Director Sakata. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Viola, I just would like to say thanks for the organization of the packet. It's simple things like the link that you have that goes back and forth oh. that really actually helps us because I like to get back to the agenda and so just hitting that link. Simple things like this really make our life a lot easier. So thank you, Viola, so much. And then even in the director's report, I added a lot of new favorite links for the flood threat uh, websites and everything. So the links are really, I love links. So well, thank you. <laughs> okay, Director Anderson. I want to get ahead of you. I move we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll race you to the parking lot. No. Uh, hope everybody will stay for lunch, though. Uh, is there a second? Director Brown. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Director Bruchet, Director Cloud.